Uh, good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the Justice Committee's 20th meeting in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices that interfere with broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? Apologies have been received from Gil Patterson. Mike Russell will be substituting, but he's caught somewhere on a motorway. He should be here <laughs> shortly. Uh, this is our final evidence session on the Community Justice Scotland Bill. I welcome Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, along with Scottish Government officials, Andy Bruce, Community Justice Division, Arlene Stewart, Community Justice Operational Unit, Elaine Hamilton, Community Justice te Bill Team, and Craig French and Carolyn O'Malley from the Legal Services Directorate. And this is an evidence session, so if the Minister wants, obviously, to invite uh, an official to speak, then that's perfectly all right. So it's an evidence session uh, committee. Um, Minister, I believe you have a very brief opening statement, because I had a word with you. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best to rattle through it, convener. Um, <laughs> The Community Justice Bill uh, provides a statutory basis for the new model for community justice in Scotland, and the, the Bill will replace the current model, which is based on eight regional CGAs, with the new model, which delivers a community justice as a solution uh, to achieving improved outcomes for community justice, to reducing reoffending, and to supporting desistance. The new model is based on the response to consultations in 2012, 13, and 14, and a much uh, partner and stakeholder engagement, which I'm happy to talk about. The new model seeks to deliver better outcomes for communities by promoting a collaborative approach to the planning and delivery of improved outcomes, putting decision-making in the hands of local communities and agencies who are best placed to assess local needs. Arrangements at a national level will provide strategic leadership, enhanced opportunities for innovation, learning and development, and assurance on the delivery of improved outcomes. I certainly want to commend the committee for taking extensive evidence from such a wide range of stakeholders, and I've followed the evidence uh, sessions closely and welcome the broad support from stakeholders for the policy principles in the bill. On the creation of the new national body, Community Justice Scotland, there is clear support for its uh, role in leading the sector, driving improvement and promoting learning and innovation. There is consensus on strong accountability arrangements to ensure that the model demonstrates the improved outcomes for communities that we all want to see have indeed been achieved. A strategic approach to community justice, which is driven by a national strategy and outcomes-focused planning, has also been welcomed. It is clear, though, that there are matters of detail where the views are more mixed and that there are practicalities around implementation that needs to be clarified. And I welcome the opportunity to do that today. Funding uh, for the new model has raised many questions, both in transition and the implementation uh, phases. And the Scottish Government is making available significant funding to assist this transition over the next three years, subject to the Comprehensive Spending Review. The transitional funding is intended to build capacity and develop further partnership arrangements across Scotland. The reports against funding will identify how this funding has been utilised in supporting the change process, and this will provide an evidence base to identify what, if any, further funding would be required for future years. I am aware of the impact that short-term funding has on planning in general and in the third sector in particular. Uh, the funding mechanism for community justice uh, social work services is currently being reviewed, and a move from an annual system of funding to funding over a three-year period is one of the issues being considered by the funding group, who will be reporting later this year. Uh, such considerations must be seen, of course, in the context of the broader financial settlement for Scotland. And I want to reassure uh, committee members and the third sector that I value the contribution the third sector uh, make to the community justice, and officials are working with the third sector now uh, to strengthen their role in the bill. Uh, on the arrangements for community justice planning, please be assured I have no wish to duplicate efforts and I would expect to see community justice being planned with the, within the wider community planning structures. Strong partnerships and co-production will be vital to the success of the new model. I also appreciate the definition of community justice requires further consideration and I will explore how we might broaden the definition at stage two. A very important issue which I heard mentioned frequently at the committee is early intervention. And this government has a clear focus on advancing the whole system approach and improving life chances. The drive in community justice to reduce reoffending is therefore part of our wider approach to promoting social justice and tackling inequality, which includes action to improve early years' experiences. Um, this is an important period for community justice in Scotland, convener. We have made clear the Scottish Government's commitment to reduce reoffending and the harm it causes to individuals, families and communities. And this uh, means making use of the evidence base to increase the use of robust and effective community sentences, reduce the use of short-term prison sentences and improve the reintegration of people who have committed offences back into communities. And I am confident that the changes brought about by the, the Bill will support that ambition. Thanks very much. I did that faster than I would normally. Faster, <laughs> but quasi-brief. Quasi-brief. <laughs> Julie's out. Quasi Can I first of all apologise, because I see Caroline O'Malley. It's not that she's invisible. She isn't here. So, <laughs> my mistake. <laughs> Mr French, yes. yes. O'Malley is here, but not as a witness this morning. Ah, yes. I, that's, I didn't mean she was absconding no, no, from her duties. <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
<laughs> well, unless she was. He's something to Not tell us. Not <laughs> Right, OK. So there we are. And now questions from members, please. John Finney, Roderick Campbell. Uh, I don't know if that's a signal or a pen waving. <clears throat> What's that? Christian Allard and Margaret Mitchell. Right, off we go. Thank you, Kavina. Margaret uh, Good morning, Minister. I, I think you may well have, with your brief or quasi-brief statement, preempted a number of questions. Can I just cover one with you, please? And that's what the, the undertaking you gave to explore the, the definition. That's very welcome. There previously was a definition that included preventing offending. Is there a particular reason why that, whilst the exploration is welcome, is there a particular reason why that wasn't utilised initially, please? Well, I, I think it is an important issue, and I <coughs> welcome the fact that Mr Finney's raised it. The government does remain very committed to the principles of uh, the Christie Commission, including making a, a decisive shift towards prevention. Prevention of first-time offending has been taken forward on a number of fronts by central and local government, with prevention already rooted in community planning. Uh, and it's our expectation, of course, that community justice planning itself will be rooted in wider community planning. Across Scottish Government, early intervention and prevention are being taken forward to a range of policies and strategies, including the early years and uh, youth justice, uh, a range of other policies that are addressing the causes of offending, such as homelessness and drugs misuse. The new national strategy for community justice will link uh, across to these other strategies, uh, which contribute early prevention and primary prevention. Uh, so, therefore, we believe there is no need to include the prevention of first-time offending in the definition of community justice or in the scope of this bill. Uh, first-time offending is being addressed, we believe, uh, by this government in other ways, which I've just outlined. So, the bill focuses on reducing reoffending rather than prevention. Um, but I hope that helps clarify how we've got to the position we have today. Of course, I'll listen to the views of the committee on that matter, um, but uh, that's, that's the approach we're taking to, to tackling prevention through, through the wider work, but uh, focusing this bill on reducing reoffending. And I suppose at that point it's preventative in terms of trying to prevent reoffending of, uh, uh, but on the part of offenders. Well, that's a, a nice distinction. I think that's what we meant by prevention, but John, you, you well, have further yeah, question. I, I mean, I'm, I understand you'll not be having a play in words here, but there are a lot of different streams that have to come together there. It's a very clear thing people would understand. They might understand prevention rather than early intervention. I, I do, do accept that, and we are considering uh, whether the definition should be expanded, as I say, and that, and that could include elements of desistance prevention and, and uh, early intervention, uh, recognising the role of community justice in secondary and tertiary prevention. But I suppose it, the point is that the, the bill itself was primarily focused on reducing reoffending. Uh, but I do take the point that Mr Finney makes, and I'm obviously in, in looking to expand the definition. We can try and bear that in mind. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Roderick, please. Thank you. Good, Good morning. Good morning, uh, Minister. Um, uh, when Dame Hailish Angelini's commission reported in 2002, it talked about community justice operating in a cluttered landscape. Um, we heard evidence from Dame Hailish, and indeed we also heard evidence from Mr Roberts of Audit Scotland that uh, it's possible that uh, complexity is inevitable in this area. But we also heard evidence uh, from uh, the Fourth Valley Health Board that uh, the more bodies we introduce, the more difficult it becomes for our population to understand and the harder it becomes for us all to engage. Our call would be for Parliament to try to make arrangements as simple as possible. Um, what can be done to try and make uh, arrangements as simple as possible so that people can more readily understand how things should operate? Well, certainly I identify with the, um, the desire to try and make things as clear and as simple and transparent as possible. I think that's entirely, um, entirely right to try and do that. I think what we have to do, though, is reflect that some of the individuals that we are potentially trying to help uh, reduce their, their, their um, reoffending and, and get them back into a positive place have it themselves extremely complicated and complex needs. And that may inevitably require the needs of a multi-agency approach uh, to tackling it. So there will be, in some cases, and maybe not every case, uh, an inevitability about involving a number of different partners <laughs> in terms of the solution uh, to try and deliver uh, a better outcome for that individual. We do believe the bill brings coherence by providing a strong leadership function and, and strategic collaborative approach to planning, reporting, commissioning of services. Um, and the new national strategy and, and common outcomes for community justice should, uh, we hope, also lend coherence and strategic direction to what community <coughs> justice uh, is aiming to achieve. So the bill disestablishes the eight community justice authorities, which are reasonably based uh, removing one layer, so that does reduce some uh, complexity, but I uh, appreciate that there, there's still a, a large number of partners and statutory um, 
uh, community uh, community justice uh, partners that are that are involved. If one accepts um, that, then the bill I think does make clear who the community justice partners are, what they're required to do, whom they must involve in taking forward uh, their work, and it also defines the role of Community Justice Scotland itself, making clear how and when Scottish ministers are, are engaged as well. Um, and the bill also sets out a role for communities. So we believe that their key relationships are articulated in the bill. I just go back to the point I made that because of the complex needs of individuals, which may involve issues involving health pr practitioners, education practitioners, housing, uh, obviously employability issues, uh, there, there's uh, inevitably for some individuals highly complex needs uh, have to be met and, and therefore we need to have that architecture there, but find a way, as Mr Campbell articulated, of trying to make the relationships as clear uh, as possible and help, help people understand how that, uh, how that process should work as effectively as possible and we believe the bill does that. What's the government's view on the suggestion made by some people that in each local authority there should be a lead community justice partner? Well certainly the, um, the, the local authorities uh, have had discussions with, with, with COSLA as, as Mr Campbell may be already aware. Um, the bill does make very clear about the, the, the duties placed on the statutory community justice partners, including local authorities, and uh, they were responsible for preparing and delivering on the community justice outcomes improvement plan for the local area and preparing that uh, plan. They must consult with Community Justice Scotland appropriate community bodies, which will include third sector service users and communities. So uh, local government partners will have a, a key role to play in that. The, the statutory uh, community justice partners must also report on the plan annually, having first consulted community bodies and anyone else they consider appropriate. So there should be good engagement between um, the local authority as part of that process and, and the relevant local community partners. And would also um, highlight that uh, Section 30 places a duty on statutory uh, community justice partners and community justice Scotland to cooperate with each other in carrying out their respective functions. So you know, there is a, a clear role there. Um, collective responsibility is obviously vital to the to the success of the new model for community justice, and that's why we, we, we don't, um, uh, in, in the process we've identified, set out a lead partner uh, for each local area. Um, but having, you know, on the basis that having a lead agency would open up uh, the potential for other partners to avoid their responsibilities and perhaps defer to that one partner to do everything. Um, so we, we want to promote collaborative working, uh, and that, th hence that's why we've not specified uh, the role for specifically for a, a, lead, a lead partner. Um, and we believe the model we've put forward vigorously promotes collaborative partnership and, uh, and, and generation of evidence as well. So, um, but it is ultimately for local community justice partners to decide how they organise themselves and assign roles. And it's, uh, it's possible that they may choose to appoint a lead role for a local authority or, or indeed, um, uh, and they have discretion to do that if that's what they wish. Uh, to what extent do you can believe or recommend or otherwise that uh, kind of smaller local authorities in particular might choose to cooperate with other local authorities? Well, certainly that, that has come up in the discussion with COSLA. Uh, in the engagement I've had with uh, COSLA, they have uh, suggested that um, the, the, obviously one of the aspects that they find attractive of the current model has been that they've been able to work together uh, at a local level. So examples were given in areas like Ayrshire, perhaps, where see local authorities might want to work together on the basis that they work together on a number of issues already. Uh, there's nothing to prevent that happening uh, through, the, through the, the, the model we propose, that there could be a degree of uh, collaboration and sharing and, and um, uh, you know, exchange of information and knowledge. It's, it's for the local partners to determine that, and we'll, we'll give them discretion in the current model that we're proposing uh, as to how they, they take forward such matters. But the key role of Community Justice Scotland in ensuring quality, if you like, quality assurance and giving confidence to uh, the communities and, and, and to, to, to Parliament about the uh, oversight of, of activity is also important as well. Thank you. Do you have any supplementaries on community partners? I would like to do something raised. Alison, yes, please. Just really following that up, please, convener. I mean, the current model um, is particularly attractive to the third sector. Um, the, 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 you don't want to go into that? Just okay. now, simply because one of the issues was that the list of community partners that was listed in, in Section 12 we felt was not comprehensive enough. Have you any views on that? Well, uh, convener, I certainly I take that point. I've, I've heard from uh, third sector and 
in, in particular. I, I don't know whether you want to focus on the third sector just now, but certainly the third, third sector and discussions I've had with... Well, um, I'll let Alison on <laughs> after uh, that, because you've gone on to it. But it wasn't just the third sector. But, but certainly, housing, yes, housing we associations will, we, we will there. We will obviously have the potential to, to look at I'm, I'm also keen to explore in terms of how the, the skills matrix for the Community Justice Scotland actually is taken forward as well, that we, we look to, to see how we can recruit appropriate expertise in housing, employability, uh, areas which are, are obviously going to be important uh, areas of knowledge for Community Justice Scotland and indeed local partners as well to identify how they, they work more effectively uh, to deliver uh, you know, solutions for individuals. Uh, but clearly we can, we can obviously review the, in operation the, uh, the, 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 the listing of those involved and um, uh, if you know, additional statutory community justice partners were required at some point in the future, Section 12.3 of the Bill allows, them to, uh, allows us to modify the Community Justice Scotland uh, and Scottish Ministers to modify the list of statutory community justice partners by regulation through affirmative yeah. procedure so Parliament would have the chance to to uh, have its view on whether additional partners should be added. But you're not minded at this stage to change it? We, to we, add. Will, we believe we have the, the, the list, but obviously if, if the committee had particularly strong views yeah. on, on that, I would listen to that clearly, but uh, we do have a mechanism in place where that could be adjusted in future, should that be required. Alison, you're launching you. into third sector, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the third sector is obviously is significant in, in this particular area, um, and we have a range of third sector uh, bodies, um, national ones and small local ones, who are all contributing um, at the moment. They find it reasonably easy to connect in with the current community justice authorities because there's only eight of them. Um, they're expressing concern about the need to um, link in with 32 different um, community justice um, partnerships. Um, how, how would you respond to that and how would you support them in order to be able to do that? Well, I think the first thing to say is I agree with Alison McInnes. I mean, it's an extremely important uh, sector and partner. I mean, I think roughly about a third of the activity that we deliver through community justice uh, already is done by the third sector. I haven't got a definitive figure on that, but I believe that's, that's, that's broadly right. So clearly the third sector have a hugely positive role they're already playing. I know from my work in drugs policy uh, and indeed um, and sort of tackling sort of issues like reducing reoffending, the role of the third sector is crucial to allowing people employment opportunities as well and a pathway back to uh, demonstrating their employability. So clearly, on a number of fronts, the third sector is, is a vital player. Um, so we believe it, you know, it is vital to the successful planning and delivery of eff effective and efficient services for individuals, and the sector, you know, does make a huge contribution. So section 18 of the bill requires that the statutory community justice partners to consult and enable the participation of the third sector in planning of services and improved outcomes for community justice. However, I do recognise the third sector themselves have said that you know, perhaps they're not as visible in the bill as they would have liked to have been. And uh, we are listening to the concerns of the third sector and we are exploring now uh, with my officials and, and third sector organisations how we might <laughs> amend provisions to provide a stronger particip participative uh, role for them in, in, in the bill um, uh, and working in partnership with them. So uh, I do know there's some concerns about commissioning uh, as well and the, uh, the uh, funding, the security of funding from the local government sector as well. Uh, and to have some concerns, I'm happy to talk about that as well if that's relevant to, to Mr McInnes's point. Well, I, I think if you might... If you don't mind convener, it would be helpful um, to use t for you to discuss how you think these reforms could be used to tackle some of the short-term funding issues that the third sector organisations face. Um, they spend a great deal of time that could be better used investing in, in, in the, the, their frontline services, chasing funding and, and, and following things up. Yes, I mean, I, I recognise these, these concerns. As I say, the, the, the uh, likes of uh, SACRO have, have, have made that point to me um, uh, and, and others as well. Um, I think the, the issue in terms of uh, financial planning is, is, is one that obviously typically people are working on a, an annual cycle and indeed to back up Mrs McInnes's point, um, I have I've heard that up to half of management time at some third sector organisations is devoted purely to securing next year's funding, which is clearly not uh, something that we, we would see as optimal to delivering their outcomes. So uh, there is some work being done to review the... Um, the, 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 the funding mechanisms that are in place, uh, recognising those constraints, uh, that short-term funding is a significant issue for many in the third sector. And uh, within, uh, we, we have sort of, uh, in Section 27, uh, funding for com uh, criminal justice social work has been protected year on year uh, in the face of um, significant cuts from uh, UK government, so the Section 27 funding. 
Uh, and we have provided, uh, I think, a total of £750 million of ring fence funding since 2008 or 9. But that doesn't deal with the, the year to year funding issues. So, a technic funding technical advisory group has been established to oversee the work of developing a new formula for Section 27 funding to replace the current model. Um, a move from annual system of funding to a funding model over a three year period is one of the issues being considered by the group uh, to help try and reduce the need for year to year. Um, uh, uh, sort of firefighting on the on the funding front, and the advisory group are due to report to the main funding group uh, this autumn. Recommendations will then be made to uh, the joint Scottish Government and Causal Settlement and Distribution Group. And if proposals are endorsed, we should see a new funding model being piloted in 2016-17 financial year, and a new funding model would then go live in 2017-18 uh, financial year. So hope that helps. Um, um, Alison McInnes sort of understand where we are with that issue, but we certainly do recognise um, both the, the, the balance in terms of there are some nationally operating uh, third sector organisations, as, uh, as Alison McInnes has said, and some very local ones. So that has to be reflected in the commissioning arrangements that it may not be appropriate to have national contracts where perhaps there's a local third sector organisation that's doing a very good role at local level, that a local community justice um, uh, operation would, would require to or would desire to keep going and to, to work with rather than having a nationally imposed model. Who's on the funding technical advisory group? If I can maybe defer that Please. to... Please, yes. Ms yeah. Stewart. The membership is drawn in for the technical advisory group is drawn mainly from local government. So local government finance officers, the cr criminal justice social work, social work Scotland, COSLA and ourselves. It reports to a broader funding group which has got representation from the third sector and others including community justice authorities. Who are, the, are we, who are the who are the voluntary sector that they report to? Who's represent? It's I just want to tease this out a bit more detail, mm -hmm. so that the voluntary sector are not just hearing sort of warm words, but that we know that they're right in the middle of being involved in all this. Absolutely, it's the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum, who are the representatives, um, and the chair of that forum sits on the main funding group, who's also the chief executive of SACRO. Okay, so any other voluntary groups in that? Any other? The forum is an umbrella group. Um, okay. So their members, when they appoint a representative, in saying, I'll be the representative, they then commit to going back and feeding back to the entire forum. We've also given the Criminal Justice Voluntary Sector Forum £50,000 this year to help them build capacity and capability for the new model. And subject to the Comprehensive Surrendering Review, we hope to do so for next year and the year after as well. And they've actually identified and appointed a post for that who's actively working with partners to say, what will be the third sector's role and how will it work in practical terms on the ground? And you, something about this technical advisory group reports in autumn. Is that next autumn? This autumn. Of course, we're in autumn. We so are in when autumn. is it, as far as I know, when is it reporting? It's due to Must report. Be shortly? It's very shortly. It's due to report the end of October into early November. Okay. Thank you very much. Alison, you... That you uh, that's OK. okay. <laughs> Christian, followed by Margaret Mitchell and Margaret McDougall. Christian, please. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, just on that particular point, if I may add, uh, we heard from West Lloyd and Community Planning Partnership who said that it's not only about the third sector, but also about the private sector and others. Now, I just wonder that if we receive a lot of calls about making sure that the third sector uh, is more in the well, uh, making sure that we, we don't lose the fact that there are others as well, and particularly the private sector, how would you, would you see uh, this changing in the well? Well, of course, um, it's possible through uh, the process, but we can't anticipate as, as yet who would who would be on Community Justice Scotland. But that in terms of employ, uh, employing those individuals to to provide skills that people with knowledge of the private sector and the opportunities might might present itself. But uh, clearly, I know from work on reducing reoffending how important the role of the private sector is in providing employment opportunities. There are some very uh, pr progressive companies out there, thankfully, who are trying to do their best to. Uh, support uh, former offenders um, who have maybe a, a, a conviction that they have to declare to get uh, an opportunity into employment in, involving uh, companies in the transport sector such as Virgin and indeed in the hospitality sector, a, hotel, a number of hotel groups that are, are good at actually employing uh, individuals in roles that are appropriate um, given clearly uh, the nature of perhaps past offences. Uh, so I think uh, there is a really positive role that the private sector can play and indeed we're encouraging private sector uh, companies and organisations and representatives such as um, Scottish Business in the Community as a kind of umbrella group that represents uh, business community 
uh, to, to work with us on trying to help provide pathways for former offenders and people with perhaps uh, substance misuse issues to, to find uh, an opportunity to get employment. And that's obviously a huge role that can be played in helping them uh, to re, uh, re establish a more positive role in the community. Thank you, Vivis. And uh, we heard you this morning saying that you may be, you might be looking to extend the remit of the bill to prevention. Uh, now, well, as the words of Pete uh, White uh, from Positive Prison, who said that he would like the word offender removing removed from the bill, is uh, that will be uh, um, something you might consider? Well, certainly, I'm, a, I'm aware of the sensitivities around. The words I mean I'm, I'm trying to be careful in what I say myself because I'm conscious I'm using those terms too. Uh, clearly, it's a hugely sensitive issue because uh, we want to try and get to a point where people who have perhaps um, served a sentence, uh, paid their debt to society, are seen again as being a positive contributor to society. And if they're wearing a, a big sign around their neck for the rest of their lives, and it's, it's not necessarily the most constructive. Um, of, of ways of referring to them, but uh, we certainly look at such issues and, and, and how we can handle that uh, in terms of the bill and indeed the guidance around the bill as well. Uh, but um, I know the, the bill is typically, as bills are drafted in, in legal terminology, it would sometimes seem a bit harsh to, uh, to those involved in, in helping uh, those who have uh, perhaps been involved and have a, a conviction or a history of conviction. Um, but we'll obviously look at those issues in due course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Remember what term Pete White suggested, but we'll come up with it in a minute when we've looked at the OR. Um, I think Mark, it may have been persons with convictions or, or something along those it? lines. Yeah. Is that, is that correct? Persons, persons who, who have at any time been convicted of an offence. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, if there are sensible terms that can be used, we can we can look at those convener. Right. Thank you. Um, Margaret Mitchell, followed by Margaret McDougall. Uh, the financial memorandum states that um, there clearly be two million available for the national body. And as one of the um, witnesses very succinctly and effectively said, there would be absolutely hee-haw available for local authorities. <laughs> now, I thought we'd get rid of hee-haw, but that would be the last hee-haw of the, of the session, I think. Yes. Now, there is the traditional, <laughs> there is the traditional funding of £1.6 for the 32 local authorities, but um, that seems to be it. So are you satisfied that the proposed funding for Community Justice Scotland represents value for money? Well, clearly, Convener, I, I recognise this is one of the key things that have been raised in evidence and um, in respect of the terminology used, uh, the, um, uh, the transitional funding which commences in the current financial year is being split equally with uh, an assessment of £50,000 going to each local authority to be used uh, across the community planning partner uh, partnership in, the, in that area. Um, that's based, uh, as I understand, on, on evidence from Perth and Kinross uh, Council in terms of the, the, their estimate of costs. Our intention uh, is for this funding to be available for three years, um, so commencing this year but ending in 2017-18. However, this position will be reviewed at the end of 2015-16 in, in light of both the outcome of the next UK Comprehensive Spending Review and any, obviously, any evidence that comes forward from the sector between now and then. But the third sector also has an important role in planning, delivery and evaluation, and hence the point that Arlene made about uh, funding for the criminal justice voluntary sector form of £50,000 per annum intended, intended anyway for the next three years. And again, this is subject to the, the outcome of the CSR uh, comprehensive spending review uh, later this, this autumn. Uh, we do recognise uh, local authorities are uh, concerned about the longer term position. Um, just point out that the total cost of the current model is £2.7 uh, million pounds per annum, of which the operating cost for community justice authorities is £1.8 million. Pounds. Um, the total cost of the new model is estimated to £2.2 .2 million, pounds, so we can't deny that there's a, an assumption of savings in the longer term, um, but that falls both on, on central uh, spending and also at the local level, and uh, we believe that the new model will be an effective means of delivering community justice at a local level, and that the comparability of costs between the two models is not is not it's not easy to make a direct comparison. Uh, you, you be aware that there's a real sensitivity between the national body and the the local bodies, and ensuring the local bodies have the the flexibility to deliver, I suppose, yeah. local solutions for local problems. So funding is really Im important in that aspect. Um, can you provide any more information about the, the work being done? 
Minister taken just now to identify problems with the, the transitional funding? Uh, for example, is there an issue about those people who are employed with criminal justice agencies now? Are they all going to be re-employed within either Community Justice Scotland or the new local authorities? If I may, I mean, I'll, I'll maybe defer to, to Arlene on, on the, the detail of the discussions that have been taking place because it's sort of happening at official level uh, between ourselves and COSLA. But, but certainly we, we're aware we have ongoing dialogue with, with COSLA about the, the financial uh, package that's available. And uh, we have uh, corresponded with them about the, you know, the evidence base. So we've highlighted the basis for our £50,000 assumption is the figures from Perthic and Ross Council and have invited them to come back with their thoughts on that in case there's any uh, contradictory evidence they have that's available. But certainly if I can just pass Darlene, uh, convener, just to, to ask her to address the point that Margaret Mitchell makes. Okay. I suppose there was, there was two points in that. One point was around the ongoing funding and what are we doing in terms of understanding how the transitional funding is being used. So on that point, we're working closely with all of the local areas. We funded a post in COSLA to lead on the transitional work. Um, and she's working closely with areas to say, what are you doing? How are you managing the change at present? We know some of the local areas already have appointed, using the funding, some coordinators to pull partners together, to start their action planning, understand how things are working on the ground, um, how well things are working on the ground, what gaps they may have and what actions they have. I was just at an event yesterday down in the borders uh, where they're doing that and they've appointed a coordinator. Others, Midlothian, Fife, West Lothian have done I've done similar. We work closely with COSLA on identifying if there are any particular issues. We've suggested to people they wish, may wish to report to us next May on how they've used the funding for this year, but we've also asked them to produce transition plans for the transition year of 1617, which we've asked them to send in for January. And that will identify what their local arrangements are, what their local priorities are for 1617, but also if they've identified any challenges and obstacles as well, and we'll work with them during that. So that's that point in how we're taking that forward. On the subject of the Community Justice Authorities, obviously there are sensitivities um, involved in that for the 20-something persons who are currently employed by the Community Justice Authorities, and we're working very closely with the conveners and also the treasurers for what that really means on the ground for the individuals. There is the opportunities afforded potentially through the transitional funding, but the recruitment to Community Justice Scotland would be through open and fair competition. Now, many of those people in the Community Justice Authorities working as they have done in this avenue, in this arena, you would hope would be well placed uh, for some of those positions. But obviously, recruitment to Community Justice Scotland would be a matter for the Chief Executive and the senior personnel when they're appointed. If they don't recruit, what happens to them then? If they don't get a recruitment place, if they don't want to, to go for even a recruitment place? They, they may not wish to go. Um, so what we've asked and in the establishment of the Community Justice Authorities, we put it about 10 years ago now, uh, we put in place that if there was ever to be any severance for, for any particular reason um, along the, the journey, uh, that they must develop severance schemes and submit them to Scottish ministers for approval. Uh, we've asked them to do that over the summer. At present, we're still getting those in. Uh, in terms of what it would mean for the individuals on the ground. When we have those in and when, once they've gone through that approval route, community justice authorities would then be able to let the individuals know what the situation would be for them. And it's the responsibility of the community justice authorities and the, as the employer to do so. But obviously we're giving them all the support we absolutely can. It's quite a technical area in terms of both human resources, but also finance, pensions and so on. If they didn't want to accept a severance and they didn't get re-recruited to a, somewhere, what would happen? I would have to check with uh, the employment lawyer around that. Um, however, my understanding is if they don't seek employment elsewhere, and some have, some have already got some of those coordinator posts, some have gone to inspection agencies and others, um, so if they don't um, seek employment elsewhere, or indeed if they don't wish to go to Community Justice Scotland, my understanding would be that it would be the severance option, unless the local authority who hosts them, it's not the employer, but who hosts them, um, wish to take them on in some form of redeployment or deployment package. So, but that would be for the local yeah. circumstances. So they really have to take the severance? But potentially. Not necessarily, but I think... Yes, you, Alison, you want to come in? 
And the government obviously has no compulsory redundancy policy, and I would hope that that would apply in this instance. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned to hear that there are eight different severance packages being developed, and I would hope that um, across Scotland everyone was treated equally. We've um, put out strong guidance around that, and what we've said is it's, it's very clear, and it's all available online, actually. Um, we've all said that they must follow the terms of the Scottish Public Finance Manual, and then that refers down to the Civil Service Compensation Scheme. And we've asked people that it must be in line with that, those schemes, and that's what they must be in line with in order to go through the approval route. Okay. So you would expect, therefore, to them all to be broadly yeah. similar. Obviously, every individual circumstances will differ. They're all been in for different lengths of time, sure, etc. Right, Are you, have you exhausted your questions yes, so far? Yes, uh -huh, yeah. Elaine, please. I just wanted a, a point of clarification on one of the Minister's answers to Margaret there, that you said, I, I, if I heard you correctly, that there was 50,000 uh, allocated to each local authority, whereas um, the indication was it was 1.6 million split between the 32 local authorities. I just wonder, is every local authority getting 50,000? Is it irrespective of the size of the authority? But that's my understanding, uh, Kadina. But certainly, so it's, it seemed yeah. a fair way of doing it. Dean, do you be happy? happy. Um, be well, happy. not happy, but she's <laughs> satisfied. <laughs> uh, Margaret, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, I'll just continue on the funding side of things. I think uh, Peter McNamara made his views quite clear at the, the session he attended on, on the funding to community justice uh, authorities. Um, and I think the feeling is that if, the, if there's going to be more prevention and less people actually being incarcerated or locked up, should there then be um, less funding going to prison services because th there actually be more work done in the community? Uh, I just wonder what your views are on that. I make myself very unpopular with my colleague, Michael Matheson, who's uh, responsible for prisons. I, I'll bring in Andy Bruce, basically, uh, in, in a minute, if I, can, if I may, convener, just on that, because Andy has a direct line on the on the prison service. But clearly, um, uh, where we can reduce reoffending, that will clearly have benefits but for wider society, not just the, the, the prison estate mm -hmm. and, and, and Scottish prison service. It will have benefits for... Uh, communities, families not seeing their loved ones incarcerated, the impact it has on children, so it will have benefits for education uh, provision and uh, potentially generate savings there. So I certainly agree that in reducing reoffending, there are, are significant uh, long-term uh, economic and, and spending, public spending benefits to, to <coughs> Scotland from tackling that issue. Clearly, um, both activities are within the justice portfolio and um, you know, we, we, we have to uh, take decisions on, on a year-to-year -year basis on, on what we fund through the Scottish Government budget. Uh, but we would look to try and uh, ensure that, uh, as Scottish Prison Service is already doing, that they themselves are, are, are key players in trying to help to reduce reoffending, and they do a considerable amount of work um, through their own preventative work within the prison estate to try and educate offenders um, who are still within the prison estate to... Uh, to, to help them reintegrate back into society. So it's possible that it wouldn't necessarily result in a reduction in Scottish prison service uh, spending because you're maybe putting more money yourselves into, into helping to, to, to further enhance that, that preventative uh, agenda and reducing reoffending. So uh, I wouldn't want to see re reducing reoffending in a little silo on its own. It can be done by a Scottish prison service, it can be done with other partners in justice. And so it's just it's important that that activity takes place. But if I can bring Andy, Andy Bruce in on the, on the detail point. Well, I absolutely recognise that... Um that logic that if we're trying to elicit the shift of balance from custody to community, then it stands to reason there should be a resource flow to, to accompany that. The difficulty, of course, is until you actually reduce the number of people in custody, it's difficult to actually realise a saving that allows you to then put that in into the community. So there's a couple of ways in which we seek to, as the Minister suggested there, one of the ways is to make sure we get the absolute most out of all the funding that is in the community already. So there's the 95 million approximately um, Section 27 funding per year that goes out for criminal justice social work. But also there's all the funding that's in the health system and alcohol and drug partnerships, for example, in education that can be brought to bear around, um, around this area to, to help with that, that prevention bit. But we are kind of making steps along the way. So members of the committee will be familiar with the work around um, women offenders, the funding that the government originally put in, 1.5 million a year, for an initial set of projects to get established. That was then extended this year, and the way that was extended was by a transfer that was made from the prison service to um, the community to allow that to happen. So 
although it's, I recognise it's a small amount, but we are starting to make that that balance, and that's a very clear example of, of doing it for um, women's community-based justice services. That money is coming from the prison service budget into the community to allow those services to be sustained and improved. Thank you for that. Um, Before you go, have you not just made the case for early intervention and prevention prior to somebody being sent to prison, being part of community justice. So you're making those savings right away. You're not having somebody in... I, don't, I can't recall how much it is, perhaps you can tell me, to have somebody in prison for the year. If you take, have you got an annual figure for that? You can give me. There is one for modelling, but I don't have it to, to hand. 36,000? 30-odd thousands. Well, it must be up, because it used to be 32,000. Um, you know, it just strikes me from what you said is you have to stop people going in to make the savings to then do it. But that's, you know, the cart and horse the wrong way around to me. I think that's probably why we were looking at early intervention and prevention in the first place, as well as preventing reoffending. Mm -hmm. And then you perhaps would make savings right away that you can plough back into community justice. I, I totally recon recognise the point you make, Convener. However, I suppose if we're looking at prevention, it's, it's much wider than just the role of community justice partners in, in, in the context of, of, of the role they would have uh, as a result of rising from the bill. <laughs> every every bit of work that's done in early years intervention potentially has a, the, the possibility of reducing the risk of someone offending in the first place. So I suppose it's about where you set, set the boundaries on, on, on that in terms of the role of Community Justice Scotland itself and, and, and its roles uh, in, yeah. in that sense. I don't quite see why you separate them. I don't quite see why you talk about silos. You've got a silo here. You've got people who've been in prison. They're in Community Justice. People who've not yet been in prison, they're somewhere else. Yeah. They are the same people. As, as, in, as, a, in a progression and um, you know that's just the point I'm making yeah. from savings to the public purse uh, Absolutely, there, there are a number of different strands of, of Scottish Government policy including our, our, our policies on youth, uh, youth uh, justice uh, on organised crime where we've got significant strands of work to prevent people offending in the first instance uh, I do recognise that the, the roles are, are important uh, and that's hence my response to Mr Finney that we will look at you know what what form uh, prevention can take in the definition of community justice, but the primary function of community justice social, social work as it currently stands is about yeah. reducing reoffending, uh, and hence this yeah. is a new model of delivering it. But uh, where we can look for for uh, synergies, and that clearly is important, and uh, clearly the, the same partners are involved in uh, in the model we're proposing, statutory partners involved in things like education, health, housing, which we know have a significant role to play in preventing people offending in the first just place. I just think it's all these local agencies will be able to identify people who are on the brink of having to be put into prison. Yeah. But they will be part of the system. And that it seems that the idea of, you know, separating the categories, it's artificial. And it's compounding the problem of people going to prison. But that, there you are. That's just my thoughts. And I, I do, do recognise the point, Camina. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not ignoring it. I, th I think the point I made to Mr. <laughs> Finney earlier on is we will look to see how we can reflect that in the definition itself. Yeah. Sorry, Margaret. Okay. <laughs> um, can I just continue? I've got that off my chest. Right. I'm glad <laughs> you did. I'm glad you got that off your chest. Um, in your response to my answer, Minister, you did mention victims and families, but victims and families, uh, witnesses, are not mentioned anywhere in the bill. And, you know, from uh, evidence we've taken, for example, from families outside, you know, they did say that, and I think rightly, say that, um, you know, victims and their families, witnesses and families of the accused are all part of the just justice system at that time. So, you know... Why are they not included in the bill? Well, clearly, um, I, I do recognise that, uh, that that victims and the families of, of victims uh, have a, a great interest in, in what's happening. We do have uh, a number of strands of work which have, through previous legislation, um, legislation that's already enforced the Victims and Witnesses um, Act as well, which have put in place measures to help uh, the victims and the families of victims understand the process and there are trigger points for communication with families as to the nature of a uh, sentence of a sentence is of, of somebody who's coming to the end of serving their sentence and whether they're going to be released to communicate uh, with the victims and families of victims to let them know what's happening and I think procedures are improving on that front but we certainly do recognise that um, there, there is a role there. There's also a role potentially for when looking at community sentences 
uh, community payback orders, for example, um, trying to make them robust so we can give confidence to the judiciary and to the communities that they are they are viable alternatives to custodial sentences, that we work with local communities who are affected by crime um, to, to, to work out what are the most sensible community uh, payback orders in, in that area. You know, there may be particular local need that, that, that uh, those who have been sentenced can actually help with, provide a, a useful uh, service to the community and, and uh, in that sense help um, you know, uh, ensure that there's faith in the in the process of community sentences that people trust they are not not weak options. They are they are ones that are of value to the community. So there's a number of different aspects in which we can we can reflect the the, the important impact that there has been on the victim and the family and indeed the community that's been affected by crime and to work with those partners to ensure that those are reflected. Um, we we haven't defined uh, the. Um, Victim Supports Scotland in, in, in the way that uh, we have other community justice partners in the bill. Um, then, and clearly, you know, Victim Supports Scotland are a key organisation that the Scottish Government works with and uh, we have reflected on their role in terms of um, the support we give to Victim Supports Scotland across Scotland. Um, in preparing the plan, we have uh, made clear that Community Justice Scotland must uh, consult, um, sorry, the, the, the local partners must consult with Community Justice Scotland and appropriate community bodies, which will include the third sector, service users and communities, and that could well include the likes of victims groups at a local level to, to work with them, as I say, to identify appropriate community sentences and, and, and packages to help uh, maintain faith in the system. Sorry, does that mean that it's not going to be in the bill then? Or you're just saying that it happens, but it's not going to be in the bill. You know, the, the victims, victims, and, victims you know, uh, groups will not be in specified the in the same way as other the community justice partners at local level, but we will be requiring the local partners to conduct uh, uh, you know, consultation with key groups at local level, including uh, that would potentially include the likes of victims groups, and we can obviously reflect that in guidelines, uh, guidance around the bill, uh, as to you know what our expectations are of engagement with groups at local level. But as I say, there's opportunities to work with victim support groups on sentences, um, and, and that Ray, uh, if we can maybe bring in Elaine um, Hamilton on this and the detail in the bill, she may be able to help um, Margaret McDougall in terms of the, how that's currently drafted. Um, yes, thank you. Um, section 18 of the bill sets out the requirements for community justice partners to engage, and at section 18.1b, um, community justice partners are required to consult uh, such community bodies in relation to the area that as they consider appropriate and such other persons as they consider appropriate. So we've, we've drafted quite widely there uh, so that third sector bodies and communities and individuals can all participate in uh, the, the planning of uh, community justice priorities in their local area. Mm -hmm. So they're not mentioned and you have no intention of including them in the bill? I, th I think that's... Yeah. Yeah. I think that's not a fair representation. What we're doing is giving them discretion to the local uh, partners to determine who they feel is appropriate. Now, clearly, uh, we can encourage um, the local uh, partners uh, to a uh, local authority level to work with victims groups, uh, and I think that would be potentially an attractive thing for them to do. What we're leaving is is, is the flexibility, and people have questioned whether there's a um, there's too much centralisation uh, in policy here. We're allowing flexibility and I would hope that local partners will work with local victims groups to try and help uh, breed their confidence in the system. Can I just ask, did you say you're producing guidance for the community justice partners? Because I think where Margaret is getting is to get the community to buy into whatever is being done rather than being done to them being done with them, I think, is your point, and yeah. victims and the, are particularly I, I part of that. I certainly accept that what uh, Margaret McDougall is saying <laughs> is very important. It has been reflected in the discussion we had at Murrayfield as well uh, last, last week with 120 stakeholders where the role of the communities was raised uh, in the context of sentencing and um, you know, the, the, uh, giving confidence to community sentences, which we recognise has to be there for people to see it as a... A viable alternative. We want to reduce the number of people incarcerated, but we need to give confidence to communities that's the, that's the right way to go. Working with local groups at a local level is, is something I think would help with that to ensure that they have confidence in the sentences, community sentences that are passed. And, and certainly we can look to see how we can reflect that in, in guidance around the bill um, to, 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 to help um, with the point that Margaret McDougall raises and give confidence that, that those groups will be consulted. We just not specified them as a, as a statutory partner for the reasons I've given. Same as you haven't 
specified housing or employment? Th th these are these are important factors, and I've said uh, earlier on in, in my evidence already today that you know in in uh, pointing people to Community Justice Scotland, we can look to try and recruit those who have expertise in that area, and I would hope that um, that will help in terms of ensuring that we are integrating those issues into our thinking. Clearly, housing, employability. Um, are, are key areas that are of, of value. Uh, local authorities have a statutory function in terms of providing housing, let us not forget. Um, so I appreciate there's a particular point about registered social landlords, um, but there, there is uh, clearly a role, a statutory role for housing, uh, in, in respect of housing, sorry, for, for local authorities through the planning system and housing, local housing strategies. So we do have a formal representation on, uh, as, a, as a statutory partner of a body, uh, at a local level that has a statutory role in housing provision uh, and equally uh, to reflect the point that was made earlier on we need to look at how we can involve employers uh, both public and private employers in third sector is clearly already we've indicated we're looking to how we can reflect the third sector as a key employment route uh, for uh, and, and and wider role that the third sector have uh, in delivering community justice thanks could i just continue just a wee bit about the guidance. Um, when would you be intending minister to publish this guidance um would it be before stage three uh, can i defer that to, to elaine thompson please uh, just elaine hamilton sorry just in that respect um guidance is being prepared at the moment it will be issued we expect after royal assent but that guidance has been taken forward in conjunction with stakeholders at the moment it is very much a collaborative um, collaborative effort to ensure that all of the relevant issues are covered and in ways which people will understand. So that guidance is ongoing in preparation at the present time in conjunction with our stakeholders. I think it would have been helpful to the committee to even see draft guidance prior to stage three when some of the concerns that are being raised by committee members may or may not be allayed, but at least it would take it a step further. Is that possible? Um, I'll take that back to my colleagues who are preparing the guidance, um, particularly with regard to transition at the present time, and uh, we will ascertain if there's something that we can share with the committee uh, before yeah, stage Yeah, I'm two. talking about involvement of housing, involvement of the witnesses and victims, that kind of stuff. I of mean, course. well, if it's once it was through Parliament, we'll never know. Um, mm -hmm. But I of think it would be helpful if we knew in advance. That would be helpful to the committee and wider, wider colleagues in, the, in, in Parliament convener, and we'll look what, to see what we can Thank do you. in time for stage three. Margaret. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the community justice authorities are made up of local ele elected members. Is there any intention to include a representative of local elected members on the Community Justice Scotland uh, board? And who would you be asking? Uh, so Clearly, the um, uh, thank you. Uh, the uh, as, as was explained by Arlene Stewart, once the uh, the uh, the organisation is is up and running and looking to recruit board members. And there's an opportunity for individuals to put themselves forward in, in that capacity. I don't think there's a, uh, a specified post on Community Justice Scotland that I'm aware of, but I'll, I'll double check with, with Arlene Stewart that we, we have specified that a, a representative of local government should be on there. But clearly, uh, that's uh, an area where uh, I believe um, the, the skills matrix, if you like, which would be developed for the board composition, would perhaps require an understanding of local government as at least um, part of at least one individual, because it's a key, local government clearly have a, a very key role uh, to play in delivering community justice uh, at a local uh, local level. So I think there's opportunities there. As I explained earlier on in a previous answer, uh, local government will have a key role in each of the 32 areas of Scotland, clearly in the community planning partnerships, uh, and already do have a, a central role there. And we see community planning partnerships and being absolutely critical to the future model. So I think through the various roles that local government will have uh, and have already touched upon, have a key role in terms of delivering um, housing at a local level and as a potential employer of people at a local level. Uh, there are a number of different facets in which local government will play a role, but uh, clearly we'll, we'll see if, if people emerge that are recruited to the board of Community Justice Scotland in due course. Okay, thanks for that. I'm glad you mentioned community planning partnerships because... Um, they are obviously key to delivering this, but there is a, quite a divergence in the performance of community planning partnerships across Scotland. How are you going to ensure that um, they are able to deliver this role? 
Well, th this, this comes, I suppose, down to the role of uh, Community Justice Scotland, and uh, clearly it will work to help support the work of the Local Community Planning Partnership in taking forward community justice, uh, provide support, advice, roll out of best practice, uh, sharing of information, try and make sure everything that can be made available in terms of good practice around Scotland is made available to each uh, local area to take forward their own their own, uh, their own work and their scope, clearly, um, where there's a uh, necessity to do so for Community Scot Scotland to, to um, provide a more direct role in trying to eliminate any uh, problems that arise at local level. But, you know, community justice uh, is obviously if it being delivered by community planning partners, including local government. Uh, we have a pathway there in terms of local accountability, so it's clearly a, an issue that's important at a local level to um, uh, uh, residents within each local authority area and uh, the usual uh, democratic accountability will also apply in terms of local government having an ac accountability for its uh, performance at a local level. But it's important that each of the partners, uh, the reason why we haven't appointed a lead partner such as a local authority is we believe all partners should support the work at a local level and they should pull their weight, uh, including um, uh, all of the, the, the statutory partners, not just leave it up to local government or indeed any other partner to deliver the whole thing on their own. So we expect, we have expectations that all will pull together and they're all equally accountable for their performance uh, to, uh, in some cases, to Scottish ministers, in other cases, to through other routes to, to other uh, bodies, but that they are accountable for their performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This will be the last lot, I think, questions. John, from, from uh, Margaret McDougall's uh, questioning, I mean, we've heard slightly divergent views from witnesses about the balance between uh, the National Criminal Justice Scotland body and uh, the roles of the local uh, uh, community justice partnerships. Um, what balance do you think the bill is actually trying to achieve in terms of, of who does what, and particularly well, in relating to uh, procurement, uh, which was one of the anxieties yes. about, uh, it was about procurement? Well, we certainly we do, do recognise that this is one of the, the key things that has arisen in, in the evidence, and uh, we do believe in the, in the, the balance of responsibilities you set out in the terms of the bill that we struck a, an appropriate balance. We are clear, uh, uh, Scottish Government are clear, that local leadership and ownership of community justice is vital to the success of the new arrangements. Um, the new model will deliver a community solution to improved outcomes for community justice. We, we believe that very strongly. Uh, and to reducing reoffending and to supporting desistance. And indeed, uh, as we've discussed earlier, looking at the role in terms of prevention, if that's possible as well. Um, but therefore, this is a first and foremost a local model and it will allow flexibility depending on local uh, third sector organisations as we discussed earlier who may have a particular strength uh, and we shouldn't impose a, a kind of a national uh, arrangement on, 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 on a local uh, partnership. We recognise that local areas are best placed to determine the outcomes that are their priority in their local area and the activities required to achieve the outcomes and these arrangements will be complemented by Community Justice Scotland working with um, local partners to provide leadership at a national level uh, to promote innovation and learning and to provide uh, quality assurance and assurance that outcomes are being delivered um, uh, at a local level. So I think we've got the balance there. We're allowing flexibility. When it comes to commissioning, I think that's a very important issue. Clearly, there are existing uh, platforms for local authorities to commission and procure uh, contracts, both with the third sector and other organisations, and we don't want to unnecessarily duplicate that. If there's good platforms that can be uh, used already um, uh, to, to procure activities and that can continue, there may be some opportunities, though, that may arise to either do something at a national level, uh, which would be impossible for either the eight current CGAs to do or uh, the 32 local community planning partnerships to do that. We can work with the local partners and Community Justice Scotland to say, right, is this, a, is this sensible that we do this at a national level? And if so, then let's do that. But where possible, um, allow the uh, ability for individual local authority uh, area community planning partnerships to work if they wish on their own, their own right or to collaborate with others, as we discussed earlier, perhaps Ayrshire's uh, authorities working together or another area working together uh, to, to jointly procure uh, contracts with the third sector or others. So we're, it's a flexible model, but it does provide the opportunity, should that be appropriate, for, for a, a, a central kind of procurement exercise where it's, it's yeah, sensible. We have been nationally procured. That would be Community Justice Scotland would manage the contracts on behalf of the... Yes. I mean, there, obviously there are other procurement vehicles available at a national level, but, you know, we, we're working through that at the moment with, with COSL as to the, the balance. But, you know, we, we think we're hopefully helping reassure them on, on that front. They were sensitive mm -hmm. to that issue, but we've explained that we, we don't want to 
um, undo the good work that has been done in terms of uh, local platforms for procurement that local authorities can work together uh, to jointly procure if that's appropriate um, for them and that's an issue for them but there may well be opportunities that we can take advantage of to do something Scotland wide that is more efficient from a from a commissioning point of view and perhaps reduces the need for individual uh, third sector organisations to, to contract individually with every single local authority. There may be groupings that come together or, and, and there are opportunities that may arise from that. I don't know whether um, Arlene Stewart wants to add anything further on that convener, but just uh, she's closer to the detail. Just to, to emphasise that first and foremost, because it is a local model, then any commissioning and the procurement and contracting, which may follow, although it may also be in-house services, um, should be done locally where there are opportunities to achieve economies of scale, either regionally um, or between two different local authorities, don't need to be next to each other, um, or indeed across Scotland, then we would expect that people would look to do so. It may be if you're putting in place a service or a contract across Scotland, that locally partners may look to Community Justice Scotland to provide support, and certainly we'd be looking for Community Justice Scotland to have people with the right set of skills to do so. However, it doesn't necessarily follow that all national contracts would have to be through Community Justice Scotland. As the Minister says, it could be using existing arrangements such as Scotland Excel or a lead local authority, lead health board, National Services Scotland and other such arrangements. Some national contracts which Community Justice Scotland may take on early doors are many of the ones that I actually manage myself at the moment. Um, so we'd be passing it across from the Scottish Government or Scottish Minister's responsibility to Community Justice Scotland. But the importance around the commissioning is that there will be, for the first time, a strategic approach to commissioning for Community Justice, which Community Justice Scotland will be developing with partners and stakeholders, including purchasers and providers, and be those providers in the third sector, in-house, or indeed in the private sector as well. Um, so that will be for the first time we'll have that in place. Uh, thank you very much. That uh, concludes the questions. Can I thank you, Minister, and your officials for yeah. your attendance? I'm going to now suspend for five minutes before we move on to the Criminal Justice Bill.
Uh, item two, uh, day four of stage two proceedings of the Criminal Justice Scotland Bill. I welcome Michael Masterson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, the meeting. I welcome Scottish Government officials who are here to support the Cabinet Secretary, but not here to take part in the proceedings, so they're silent. Members should have their cop well, as far as we're concerned, not to the Minister. Members should have copies of the Bill of Marshall list and groupings of amendments for today's consideration. The Government sent purpose and effect notes for their amendments for last week's session. We also find them useful for this session. I say I aim to complete all amendments today. You're nailed to your chairs. But if necessary, we'll have a little break after an hour or so if I see you're faltering uh, at all. <laughs> Now, I'm going to move straight on. Uh, before I do that, I've just remembered it's all right. I call, I've got two declarations of interest. Alison. Thank you very much. Can, you... yeah, can I just draw members' attention to my register of interest, in particular my membership of um, Justice Scotland? Roderick. My register of interest is a member of the Faculty of Advocates. Anybody else? Before I forget. Right. Uh, first of all, call Amendment 18 in the name of John Finney Group with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Can I point out there are various preemptions in this group as a result of which if Amendment 18 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 142. If Amendment 145 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 20. If Amendment 147 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 21. But I'll repeat that as we go along. I don't expect you to commit that to memory immediately. John, please, to move Amendment 18 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Amendment 18 um, and the others uh, cover the, the section about investigative liberation and release and conditions. An amendment, my amendment would allow for a period during which a suspect can re be released from custody should be any period up to a maximum of 28 days. And that differs from the blanket 28 days as outlined in Section 14.1 of the Bill. Uh, Lord Carlaby rec recommended that the period during which a suspect could be subject to investigative liberation should not exceed 28 days. Now, the Law Society support this amendment, and they believe that uh, an advantage of a shorter period upon which a person can be released from custody is that, in terms of Section 14.2 of the Bill, it's more likely conditions imposed by a constable will be subject to it will be, expected, pardon, be accepted by an individual subject to investigative liberation on the basis that a shorter period is provided for. This is a, a major change, and it's not Lord Callaby's proposal. There's a question of proportionality attached to it. Um, as regards <coughs> the government's 146, once again we see a, a diminution of the authority being exercised from inspector to sergeant um, um, and uh, we debated last time and we heard what seemed to be a Police Scotland's view on it. Well, the view is, of course, that we have equal access to uh, facilities across Scotland, and I think it's entirely reasonable that we maintain it as an inspector authorising that. Uh, amendments 22 to 27, the effect of would be to allow a sheriff to not only review a condition of interim liberation in terms of Section 14, but also the time period imposed. Uh, now, we know that the Bill facilitates a review of terms. Why not... Uh, duration. As I said earlier, Lord Carlway never intended a blanket 28 days. Thank you. Did I get you to move Amendment yes, I 18, I formally please. move 18. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, to speak <coughs> to Amendment 142, please, and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, amendments in this group relate to investigative liberation. Uh, this is a new process for the police. At present, if the police want to liberate a suspect uh, subject to conditions uh, such as requirements not to approach victims or witnesses, uh, they must charge the suspect. What Lord Calloway recommended was that the police should also be able to release a suspect subject to conditions, even though the suspect has not been charged, uh, but that the conditions should apply for a limited period only. Uh, this recommendation uh, recognises that in some of today's complex police investigations, the police may need uh, to break off an interview while they wait for laboratory, uh, laboratory results or mobile phone uh, records, uh, for example. Uh, imposing conditions on a suspect for a limited period only means the police can leave the suspect at liberty while other aspects of the investigation are progressed. But it allows the police to take the suspect straight back into custody in event of any attempt to interfere with the victims or witnesses or otherwise compromise the investigation. My amendments in this group are aimed to ensure that investigative liberation process works fairly and proportionately, and I'll speak to those later. 
I agree that it is important to ensure that investigative liberation conditions do not have an unnecessary impact on a suspect's private life, uh, but uh, regret that the government cannot support the amendments in this group in the name of John Finney or Elaine Murray. I'll speak first about amendments 18 to 27 in the name of John Finney. I agree entirely uh, that it would not be appropriate for every suspect released uh, on investigative liberation to be subject to conditions for a full 28 days. But the bill already ensures that this will not happen. The bill as drafted does not impose a blanket 28-day investigative liberation period. What it does is provide it, what it does provide is that if they have not been lifted before then, investigative liberation conditions will fall away automatically after 28 days. This reflects Lord Callaway's recommendation that 28 days is the appropriate maximum period for investigative liberation. Section 15 sets out that conditions must end after 28 days and can end sooner. Section 16 and 17 set out how conditions can be modified or removed before the end of the 28-day period. In particular, Section 16 requires that an inspector must keep under review whether or not there are still reasonable grounds to suspect that the person subject to the conditions committed an offence and that the conditions imposed continue to satisfy the demanding test of being necessary and proportionate to ensure the proper conduct of the investigation. If the inspector is not satisfied that those tests are met, either uh, more uh, proportionate conditions can be imposed or else the conditions must be lifted altogether. And if a suspect is not satisfied with the police's review of the appropriateness of the conditions, Section 17 allows the suspect to challenge the conditions before a sheriff, who will also have the power to modify the conditions or to remove them completely. Investigative liberation is all about the conditions imposed and that the legislation makes clear that those conditions can be removed after review by an inspector or by a sheriff. This can happen at any time and there is no requirement for them to be in place for 28 days. As soon as conditions stop being both necessary and proportionate, the Bill states that they must be removed or modified. 28 days is the backstop. The decision about when it is no longer appropriate to keep a person subject to investigative liberation will be made on a day-to-day -day basis or as the investigation into the offence unfolds. What the amendments in John Finney's name it would do is cause investigative liberation conditions imposed on the suspect to fall away after a number of days, not exceeding 28 days, which the police are to specify at the time of releasing the suspect. It might be possible in some cases for the police to do what John Finney's Amendment 19 would require them to do, which is to estimate and specify at the time of release the suspect, uh, the, the, the specific period of time required to carry out further investigations. Where the police are able to do so, they could set a short period, a shorter period at the outset. Uh, but this would only ever be an estimate. Investigations are not always predictable. The purpose of imposing investigative liberation conditions is to protect the interests of justice and help to protect victims and witnesses. If the police guessed wrongly by a day or two and underestimated how long it would be required to carry out the investigation, this would mean that the investigative liberation conditions would cease to apply at a time when they are still needed to protect alleged victims. John Finney's Amendment 22 would allow a sheriff to review not only the investigative liberation conditions imposed on a suspect, but also the period specified by the police during which the conditions would run. In other words, Amendment 22 presupposes that the other amendments in this group, in the name of John Finney, will be supported. I do not think that it is feasible or in the interest of justice to require constables to have to specify a period for investigative liberation to run, and, to, and it follows that there is no reason uh, for giving sheriffs the power to review any period specified. I therefore invite John Finney not to oppress amendments 18 to 27. 
Elaine, uh, Murray's Amendment 47 would change the purpose for which investigative liberation conditions may be imposed. Conditions would still have to be necessary and proportionate, but would have to be for the purposes of securing specific things, rather than the broad purposes of ensuring the proper conduct of the investigation. I'm concerned that the list of purposes uh, for which conditions uh, could be imposed could uh, be unnecessarily restrictive and may suggest that the detailed, propo the, the detailed propo uh, purposes should be linked to standard conditions. Investigative liberation conditions need to be tailored to the needs of the particular investigation. Standard conditions could be too restrictive in some circumstances and insufficient in others. The thrust of any conditions imposed under investigative liberation is that it should be necessary and proportionate. Some of the purposes listed in Amendment 47 appear inconsistent with that general purpose. There is no requirement for a person to surrender themselves to custody as the police already have the power to arrest during the period of investigative liberation. Whilst it might seem pertinent for the police to take into account a person's protection and well-being when setting conditions, this could lead to conditions being set which would not be proportionate or indeed necessary for a person not charged with an offence. And I therefore invite Elaine Murray not to press Amendment 47. But I will undertake to consider before Stage 3 whether an amendment is necessary to expand or to illustrate what the general purposes of ensuring the proper conduct of the investigation under Section 14 might cover. The convener, I'll turn to the amendments in my name. The bill as introduced allowed a suspect to be subject to a number of periods of investigative liberation, uh, provided the total of the period did not exceed 28 days. Amendments 142 and 145 and 147 change the position so that investigative liberation conditions can only be imposed on a suspect for a maximum period of 28 consecutive days in relation to a particular investigation. It will not be possible to impose investigative liberation conditions over a number of shorter periods, adding up to a total of 28 days. These concerns were raised uh, by some at stage one and the police, uh, that the police would be able uh, to subject a person to repeated arrests and periods subject to investigative liberation conditions are dealt with uh, through these, in these amendments. Amendment 143 sets out certain types of condition that can and cannot be imposed when releasing a person on investigative liberation. Requiring a person to be in a particular place at a particular time, for example a home detention curfew, would significantly disrupt most people's lives. In the government's view, that would be too severe an intrusion into the liberty of someone who has not been and may never be charged with an offence. So the amendment provides that conditions which impose curfew will not be permitted. It will, however, be possible to impose conditions banning a suspect from being in a particular place at a particular time in order to protect victims and witnesses and prevent interference with evidence. Amendment 146 will allow investigative liberation conditions to be authorised by a police officer of sergeant rank or above. The bill presently provides that conditions must be, must be offered authorised by a constable of inspector rank or above, but in mo most cases custody sergeants will make the initial decision on whether it is necessary or proportionate to keep a person in custody. Like all constables, custody sergeants will be under an ongoing general duty to take every precaution to ensure that a person is not unnecessarily or unreasonably held in police custody. So having taken the initial decision to keep a person in custody, they will need to keep under consideration whether it remains necessary to hold that person. At present, the bill would not allow a custody sergeant to release a person subject to investigative liberation conditions, but this amendment would allow that specialist officer to release the person subject to conditions. Custody sergeants are under the command of Police Scotland's Custody Div Div Division, which sits separately from the Territorial Policing Division. It deals with the safety and well-being of those in police custody. It has its own management and governance, governance structure, which is independent of the Territorial Division and is commanded by a Chief Superintendent, who is accountable directly to an Assistant Chief Constable, 
who is a member of the force executive. This ensures better oversight and management of persons in custody and better decision making on custody matters. The independence and increased professionalisation of custody division removes the need for decisions on liberation to be taken at an inspector level. The officer best placed to make decisions on a person's liberation and by extension any conditions that are to be attached to that liberation will in most cases be the sergeant in charge of the custody centre. I consider these amendments for the management and governance of custody facilities coupled with the procedural safeguards built into the bill mean that it is appropriate uh, that the most uh, investigative liberation conditions to be set by a custody sergeant. A custody sergeant will be independent from the investigation, so we'll need to consult the senior investigating officer to determine what conditions are necessary for the interests of the investigation and to protect victims. This process will ensure that conditions are tailored to the investigation, but that the final decision on what is proportionate and necessary will be made by an officer with the right knowledge and expertise in dealing with custody matters. The bill sets a maximum, uh, sorry, a minimum authorisation rank for investigative liberation decisions. I believe that the rank should be sergeant, uh, but investigative liberation decisions could uh, also be made by more senior officers. The bill provides the detailed framework and sets a minimum rank required to ensure good decision making on investigative liberation. These provisions uh, have to be flexible enough to cover relatively minor offences, complex technical investigations and also very serious offences. It will be for the police to ensure that the new option of investigative liberation is used appropriately and proportionately in each case. This uh, legislation provides a legal framework, but day-to-day decision-making will be supported by detailed guidance. Uh, the police guidance and the standard operating procedures for custody will be revised to take account of this bill. In doing that, there will be scope for the police to develop more finely grained authorisation processes for investigative liberation conditions in different circumstances. Higher authorisation requirements could be set uh, before a suspect could be released on investigative liberation for particular offences, for example, domestic violence, types of suspects, for example, children, uh, or when setting unusual conditions. But I believe there is practical operational matters for police. This is a practical operation matter for Police Scotland, and it would be unnecessarily restrictive to set that detail on the face of the bill. There will still be a requirement for any conditions set to be kept under review by an inspector. That inspector could modify any conditions set by a sergeant which inspector did not agree were necessary and proportionate. Authorisation to release uh, on investigative liberation will be given during the initial 12 hours detention period and I believe custody sergeants are best placed to make those decisions. But the requirement to keep conditions under review will ensure that all conditions are subject to detailed oversight by inspectors. The amendments in my name in this group are designed to ensure that in all cases, correct and fully informed decisions are made and that proper conduct of the investigation is assured and that the rights of the individual are protected. And I would invite the committee to support these amendments. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Elaine, please to speak to Amendment 47 and other amendments in the group. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Um, my Amendment uh, 47... Uh, uh, to section 14 uh, replaces the conditions being imposed for the purpose of proper conduct of the investigation into a relevant offence with a series of conditions required of the person. The reason behind that was that it seems to be more appropriate that when somebody is released on conditions, the conditions actually relate to their behaviour when they've released rather than the way in which the police have conducted the inquiry. And, and that, that was actually raised in, in evidence with us during the stage one uh, part of the bill. But I have to say that the you know, the Cabinet Secretary's <laughs> comments on this are helpful uh, in, in his previous uh, uh, discussion of these amendments, so I, I, I certainly bear those in mind. And I note that I have a similar Amendment 48, uh, which will be discussed later, and I note at that point the uh, Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 155 is similar to my Amendment 48, so I wonder whether a similar sort of uh, uh, amendment could maybe come in at Stage 3, if mine is too restrictive, that there might be a a preferable way of doing it at stage three, because I think it is important that the, the, the release on, on conditions is actually about the way the person behaves when, when they're on, 
on investigative liberation on in terms of John Finney's amendments uh, I'm was very supportive to his policy intention again I think the cabinet secretary's comments on that are uh, helpful and I'll be interested in seeing how, how John uh, reacts to that when he, he comes to sum up um, finally on 143 uh, which um, no longer permits curfew I'm very supportive of, of that amendment as well any other members wishing? Roger Campbell. Uh, just very briefly, convener, just on uh, Elaine's amendment, again, I have some sympathy with what Elaine was suggesting, but I've also borne in mind what uh, the Cabinet Secretary said this morning. On uh, John Finney's amendments, I think he does need to reflect further on the detailed provisions in 15, 16 and 17 of, of the bill at the moment, on the basis that 28 days is a long stop period and it could be a great deal less. Uh, and there are these safeguard provisions in there, and I think we should reflect on that. Um, and I just disagree with the idea that uh, there should be an additional test of, uh, uh, to, to determine the length before a sheriff. Margaret. Yes, um, I, I think it's good John Finney has, has raised this point, but I think the Minister's um, Amendment 142 real, uh, allays the, the concerns we had um, about the provision as it appears in the bill and explains what will happen more fully. Uh, in terms of Elaine's uh, amendment, again, <coughs> the idea behind it is good, but uh, it's not flexible enough, I think, to, to suit every situation, and I welcome the Minister's um, the Minister's offer to look at this again, perhaps at, at stage three. Um, basically, I, I think the amendments tabled in the Minister's name under this section have made the improvements that will help the bill um, generally. Thank you. John, please, to wind up. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, I've, I've noted everything, <laughs> everything that's been said. I should stress that Lord Carley never intended a blanket 28 days. And I reiterate that the Law Society support this um, particular amendment. The Cabinet Secretary said this was a new process, and he's right, and, and he talks about being subject to, to conditions. What we have heard again is this: there's complex investigations. Well, some of us recall a period when uh, the, the introduction of a six-hour detention was seen as a huge draconian step. We then moved through the various phases of that, and we're now being told 28 days is, is, is required. Um, I think language is very important, and the portrayal of anyone who's not supportive of these measures as being somehow less supportive of victims of crime, I think, um, would be unfortunate and entirely inaccurate. So, for instance, when the, the, the Cabinet Secretary said, talked about the implications this would have on the attempt to interfere with witnesses, well, if you attempt to interfere with witnesses at the moment, that's a crime at common law of um, uh, attempting to pervert and you'll be arrested without warrant and that's the right way it would be uh, treated. So this particular as yet um, piece of legislation has no impact on that. <coughs> Excuse me. The 28 days, um, again, we rightly get the assurance um, from the Cabinet Secretary that an inspector will keep that under review, yet we have a, a sergeant authorising this, and again, the same information put out about um, custody division. Well, I, I know that um, Police Scotland may feel that that's, that's a, an important use of terminology, but people do play a lot of store in the decisions in the supervisory role played in relation to not only detention, um, retaining someone in detention, but, uh, um, and I should point out that every constable has an obligation to ensure that no one's disproportionately retained in custody. Um, it is about um, uh, the, the question of uh, proportionality, um, and it is my view that the backstop remains um, excessive, uh, and for these reasons uh, I will press the amendment. Thank you. Uh, the question is, amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Was against, please show. That three in favour, six against, that amendment is not agreed to. I call amendment 142 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment 18. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is amendment 142 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. No. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 841 against, that amendment is agreed to. The question, sorry, call amendment 47 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated amendment 18. Elaine, to move or not move? Not move. 
Call Amendment 143 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated Amendment 18. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 143 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. Call Amendment 19 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 18. Move or not move, John? <coughs> Thank yeah. you. The question is that, so I beg your pardon, call Amendment 144 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. The group with amendments 158, 159 and 198 to 204. Cabinet Secretary, please, to move Amendment 144 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, amendment uh, 144, 158, 159 and 198 to 204 in this group make no change to the substance of the bill. They simply improve its structure. Uh, the amendments uh, move uh, what is uh, presently Chapter 7 of Part 1 into a schedule. Uh, chapter 7 sets out the consequences for someone who fails to comply with conditions imposed on them when they are released from police custody, either on investigative liberation or an undertaking. Uh, the consequence uh, essentially being that they have committed an offence. Part 1 is mainly concerned with setting down the rules according uh, to which the police are to deal with suspects, and the chapter flows better if those rules are not interrupted by a chapter dealing with what the courts are to do in the event that a suspect uh, breaches a condition imposed on him or her by the police. And I move Amendment 144. Thank you very much. Anyone else wishing to? Cabinet Secretary, I take it, don't want to wind up. The question is, Amendment 144 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Call Amendment 145 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated. I remind members of Amendment 145 is agreed to. I cannot call Amendment 20. It's preempted. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is, Amendment 145 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed there'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. And there are no abstentions. Eight in favour, one against. That amendment is agreed to. The question is that Amendment 145... I beg your pardon. Yes, the question is... I've done that. Um, um, call Amendment... 146, yes, thank you. I've got a team here helping me. I call <laughs> Amendment 146 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 18. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Uh, moved. The question is Amendment 146 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Seven in favour, two against, no abstentions. That amendment is agreed to. The questions of Section 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Call Amendment 147 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 18. Can I remind members of Amendment 147 is agreed to? I cannot call Amendment 21, which is preempted. Cabinet Secretary <coughs> to move formally. Moved. The questions of Amendment 147 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Eight in favour, one against, no abstention. That amendment is agreed to. The question is that section... I've got this bit right. The question is that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yeah. The question is that section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 22 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with amendment 18. John, move or not move? No. Come here. Call amendment 23 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with amendment 18. Move or not move? Uh, not move, convener. Likewise, the others, if that helps. I have to call them. Right, okay. Call Amendment 24 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 18. Move or not move? Not move, convener. Call Amendment 25 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 18. Move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 26 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 18. Move or not move? Not move, convener. Call Amendment 27 in the name of John Finney. Already debated with Amendment 18. Move or not move? Not move, convener. Questions that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 148 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with 119. Cabinet Secretary, move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 148 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 149 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary in a group in its own. Cabinet Secretary, please, to move and speak to that amendment. Amendment 149 clarifies part of Section 18 of the Bill. Section 18 requires that, wherever practical, a person who has been arrested and charged uh, and is not being liberated must be brought before a court no later than the, the end of the court's first, day, uh, first sitting day uh, after charge. Uh, the words, uh, wherever practical, uh, allow for 
rare situations where it is not possible for an accused to be brought before a court by the end of the first sitting day. This might happen if, for example, there was an unusual distance or very bad weather uh, which prevented travelling between a remote police station and court by the first sitting day. It might also happen if the accused person became ill and was unfit to attend court on the first sitting day. Amendment 149 it restructures section 18.2 and clarifies that if it is not practical uh, to bring someone before the court on the first sitting day, uh, then the person should be brought before the court as soon as practical after that. And I move Amendment 149. Any other members wish to speak? I take a cabinet circuit that wish to wind up. The question is Amendment 149 be agreed to or we all agreed? Call Amendment 101 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. All already debated with Amendment 73. That was on the second day, in case you've forgotten. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that Section 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 150 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with Amendments 150A, 151, 152, 65, 255, 196, 197 and 222. Cabinet Secretary, please to move Amendment 150 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Amendment 150 replaces section 43.4 of the Criminal Procedures Scotland <coughs> Act 1995, which provides that if a child is to be brought before a court, the child should be kept in a place of safety rather than a police station. Uh, the amendment will uh, preserve a protection for children when the police decide they must hold them in custody, which they are only likely to do in cases of the most serious offences. Children First have indicated their support for this amendment, uh, which we welcome. Uh, we recognise that it has been suggested that consideration should be given to extending this to all 16 and 17 year olds, rather than only those subject to a compulsory supervision order, and we would be happy to engage on the implications of this. Uh, amendment uh, 150A uh, from John Finney amends Amendment 150. Amendment 150 defines an appropriate constable in relation to certification that detention in a police station is more appropriate than a place of safety, as meaning a constable of the rank of inspector or above. Amendment 150A omits inspector and inserts superintendent, meaning certification will have to be made by an officer of the rank of superintendent or above. Uh, currently, certification made it may be uh, by an inspector or above or the officer in charge of the police station in which a child is brought. It's important uh, that decisions are made in a timely, efficient and proportionate way, making best use of knowledge, skills, experience and training of inspectors while ensuring they are supported in decision making if needed. Such an approach is in the interests of the children and young people. There are a limited number of superintendents and requiring a superintendent to make a decision may not be in the interests of the child as a superintendent will not necessarily be at a station so a delay may be uh, to the detriment of the child. Uh, requiring uh, certification by a superintendent or above would constrain the police's operational flexibility and does not make best use of the skills, knowledge and capability of appropriate officers of the rank of inspector or chief inspector. It's important that we support effective decision-making at the appropriate level of seniority and, for the reasons given, I would ask Mr Finney to withdraw his amendment. Amendment 151 replaces Section 423 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. The amendment requires the police to notify at least one parent or guardian, if they can be found, of the court where the child is to appear, at the date on which the person is to be brought before the court, that their attendance at court may be required and in supplement to existing law, the general nature of the offence which, for with which the person has been charged. Uh, the police may withhold such notification if they have grounds to believe that doing so would be detrimental to the child's well-being. Amendment 52 replaces Section 42.7 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995. The amendment requires the police to notify the relevant local authority as to where the child is to appear, of the date on which the person is to be brought before the court, and of the general nature of the offence with which the person has been charged. The relevant local authority being the local authority for the area when the court sits. 
In line with other provisions of the bill, this protection has been extended to 16 and 17 year olds subject to supervision. Turning now to section 42 of this bill. This is a progressive and significant provision in the bill which requires a constable to treat the need of safeguard and promote the well-being of the child as a primary consideration. With reference to Elaine Murray's Amendment 65, the term well-being is consistent with the language used in the Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014 and is understood by the police. The term well-being was given full consideration by Parliament in the context of the Children and Young People's Bill and there was strong support from children's groups around its use. Well-being is at the heart of getting it right for every child, which itself is rooted in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The principles of UNCRC are the foundation for any assessment of a, child, a child's or young person's well-being. Our approach is consistent with a wider assessment of the needs of children. It is this wider assessment which the Bill requires the police uh, make a primary consideration as they decide whether to arrest, detain, interview or charge a child. Uh, the factors uh, that they will consider will be dictated by the circumstances of the investigation they are dealing with. It's right that the well-being of the child should be primarily considered in all these circumstances. Any assessment of well-being must seek to identify all the factors in the child's or young person's life which may be benefiting or adversely affecting their well-being. This can potentially help further children's rights as it is more inclusive. Consistency is important in this area and the forthcoming statutory guidance on well-being in respect of the Children and Young People's uh, Scotland Act 2014 reinforces the value in aligning with the 2014 Act on this issue. There is a danger in creating confusion around terminology and both the 2014 Act and this bill provides consistency and clarity around expectations. The committee highlighted concerns regarding the lack of consistency in use of terms welfare, best interests and well-being of the child in this and other legislation. As demonstrated through Amendment 151, 170, 188 and 196, I have taken that on board to ensure consistency. If the phrase best interest is amended into section 42, then that inconsistency is reintroduced. Taking account of these points, I would therefore ask Elaine Murray to withdraw Amendment uh, 65. Amendment uh, 196 replaces the protections in section 42.9 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, ensuring that, where it is practicable and not detrimental to the well-being of a child who is officially accused of committing an offence, that child should not associate with an adult when in custody. Amendment 197 replaces section 43.5 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 and continues to ensure that the principal reporter is notified of cases where the procurator fiscal has decided, for whatever reason, not to proceed with the prosecution against a child. The purpose of this is to enable the principal reporter to consider whether other appropriate action should be taken. In particular, the amendment makes clear that where a constable nonetheless reasonably suspects that the child has committed an offence that has led to their detention, then despite the decision not to prosecute, the child may be kept in a place of safety in accordance with the provisions of the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 until the principal reporter has decided whether it is necessary to make a compulsory supervision order in respect of the child. The effect of this provision largely reflects the status quo. Amendment 222 adjusts the meaning of police custody as a consequence of Amendment 197. The effect will be that a person not being prosecuted will no longer be in police custody within the meaning of Part 1 of the Bill. This would apply if the principal reporter has directed that the person should remain in a place of safety under Section 65 of the Children's Hearings Scotland Act 2011, pending a decision on whether to make a compulsory supervision order in respect of the person. Amendment 255 in the name of Alison McInnes is an amendment to Section 42 of the Bill, which relates to safeguarding and promoting the well-being 
of the child as a primary consideration. The amendment would add a subsection stating that a decision to hold a child in custody or interview a child about an offence must be exercised for the shortest possible period of time. I'm not entirely clear about uh, what exercising the decision means, but what I take the general point about but I take the general point about ensuring children are not kept in custody or interviewed for longer than is necessary. There is already a general duty under section 41 of the bill to ensure that people are not held unnecessarily, which already has that effect. But importantly, this is in light of the test of necessity. The phase shortest time possible has no such test and could lead to a release where that was not appropriate. Section 10 also sets a, careful, a carefully balanced test which must be considered before anyone is held in custody and in deciding whether that test is met in relation to a child, the police will have the well-being of the child as a primary consideration, as provided for in section 42. Amendment 255 therefore adds nothing further to the bill and does not work as a matter of ordinary language, and I would therefore invite Alison McInnes to withdraw it. And I therefore move Amendment 155. Oh, what, sorry, 150. 150, Cabinet Secretary, thank you. John Finney, please, to move Amendment 150A and speak the other amendments in the group. OK, thank you, Convener. I formally move Amendment 150A. Uh, and, and I warmly welcome um, Amendment 150 from the, the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I am sure most police officers will acknowledge that one of the most challenging things to do is to deal with uh, young people in, in circumstances like this. And this background is, is, is very important. It may seem that it just uh, it was a change for change's sake to put this, this particular um, amendment in, given that I fully support everything that's there before. Um, the danger is that... Um, uh, and the thinking behind it was that it was a decision of such importance that would be done from someone detached from the operational experience. Now, um, the Cabinet Secretary says that uh, a superintendent will not be at every station. I sincerely hope not. That would mean far too many superintendents. But likewise, an inspector won't be at every station. Um, and um, I think that I'm quite sure that the Cabinet Secretary isn't trying to say that a superintendent wouldn't be available to make timely decisions not least because a duty superintendent has to make timely decisions in very sensitive matters, which we didn't need to go into here. Now, to my mind, there's nothing more sensitive than a decision to formally detain a child like that. So I, I will maintain the amendment. Thank you. Elaine Murray, please, to speak to Amendment 65 and other amendments in the group. Thank you, Convener. Um, the Cabinet Secretary uh, said that Children First uh, supported his amendments, but actually originally they didn't support his amendments because they looked as if they would be discussed with others that are coming out uh, in, uh, later on on the rights of under-18s. Uh, and predominantly that's actually because these amendments actually don't go far enough. They, they would protect a very small number of 16 and 17-year-olds uh, who are under compulsory supervision orders, uh, but not other 16 and 17 year olds. But because of the way in which this is placed within our discussions, um, I will support these amendments at this point, but I think they need further amendment uh, at stage three uh, to, to give greater protection to 16 and 17 year olds. Um, as far as Amendment 65 to Section 42 is concerned, uh, this is the, the Section 42 is called the duty to consider child's best interests. And so if my amendment uh, introducing the, t the concept of best in uh, interests in the text is, is uh, inconsistent or confusing, I can't see how having best interests in, in the title is any less so. Um, the meaning of best interests has been determined by a body of case law and is nationally and internationally recognised. It has been used since 1959 and is in accordance with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Best interest, as I've said, is used in the title for Section 42, but not in the text, and I think that is inconsistent. Well-being is a relatively new term. It's not well-defined, although it is in uh, past legislation, uh, but it's not as well-defined as best interest, and it could be difficult to define the context in the context of uh, Section 42, and therefore difficult to implement. The use of best interests uh, of a child is in line with international human rights uh, obligations. Uh, and on uh, 150A, I was prepared just to listen to what John Finney uh, has to say and I think he's convinced me that his amendment is appropriate. Alison, please, to speak to Amendment 255 and other amendments in the group. Thank you very much. Um, 
Section 42, as we've heard, places a duty on a constable to consider a child's best interests in the early stages of the criminal justice process, and it currently states that in taking decisions on arrest, custody, interviews and charge, the constable must treat the need to safeguard and promote the well-being of the child as a primary consideration. My amendment 255 would require the constable to exercise their power to hold the child in police custody and interview them for the shortest possible period of time. And the intention is to make, quite clearly make it explicit that that has to be a consideration. The amendment is supported by Justice Scotland and the intention is obvious. It is to ensure that when constables are making decisions, they bear in mind the unique vulnerability of children and the potentially damaging impact of their being held in custody or interviewed for long periods of time. I think this is even more important um, following the revision to the bill last week, um, which I opposed. Um, children could be held for up to 24 hours, um, and it's, it's to um, emphasise the need uh, not to use up all of that time. And I will continue to press my amendment. I also support... Not yeah, but Sorry. You're, Sorry. you're just, just Sorry. speaking to it. Yes. Anyone else wish to come in? Margaret Mitchell. Yeah, just on John, Minnie, uh, John Finney's amendment, I, I do understand the, um, the, the intention behind it. You know, this is a serious decision, should be taken by a high-ranking officer. But I wonder if he's considered the unintended consequence, whereas the inspector could make the decision faster if they happen to, to be there and um, could make a decision that it wasn't appropriate to keep the child in custody and therefore to actually wait till you got uh, a superintendent. Um, it seems to me we're, we're, we're widening the scope by having inspectors, superintendent. There could be personnel uh, more readily available to take this very important decision more timeously. Uh, it's just something to consider. Um, I was persuaded that the minister more or less had that right with his amendment. In terms of Elaine Murray's, I think there is um, a an issue about the terminology, especially if best interest is, is used in the title, um, but the Minister is very sure, or the Cabinet Secretary is very sure that um, the, the phrase well-being is, is the more appropriate one, so perhaps that's a drafting issue or there might be something more fundamental there, but it certainly, I think, needs looked at. And in, time, in terms of Alison um, McInnes's 255, Again, the sentiment, absolutely right, this, the shortest possible time. But I wonder just how, how you define that, you know. Is, is there some test that can be devised? Is it more relative? And therefore, if it's vaguer, uh, is it adding anything? So I'm certainly uncertain about that, listening. Uh, I'd be interested to, to listen to the Cabinet Secretary's comments. Roderick. Uh, thank you, Convener. Just in relation to uh, John Finney's amendment, I think introducing a requirement of using a superintendent would be unnecessarily restrictive and not necessarily in the best interests of the child. Regarding Elaine Murray's amendment, I have to say I've got some sympathy with this, and in terms of uh, consistency, I, I think we, we are kind of struggling a wee bit. I, I am persuaded by the Cabinet Secretary, however, that we'll, we will at least be consistent with the 2014 Act. What I still can't quite understand is uh, what consideration might have been given in 2014 to the use of well-being in the implications for the 1995 Children Act, which refers to best interests. So uh, I think it would still be helpful for further clarification on the point before Stage 3. Nobody else? Uh, Cabinet Secretary, wind up on, amend on Amendment 150. Okay. It may be helpful if I deal with the issue about the title, uh, first of all. Uh, that's already been changed uh, within the bill. It's not a matter of amendment within the legislation. It's a matter that's actually dealt with through printing. So it's been changed to, from best interest to well-being uh, to ensure there is that consistency. So I hope that, hopefully that addresses the uh, concern that members had regarding the title uh, within the bill. Um, Just clarify, we there would be a reprint... There's a, it's a matter of printing, yes. It's not a matter of amendment to the bill, and there will be a reprint of the bill, uh, which will be before stage three. Yes, it uh, hasn't been will... changed yet, but it will be changed with the permission of parliamentary authorities. Is that correct? Yes, there's a technical process that it goes through uh, right. for that. Just to clarify is, for the record. So it will be, it will be well-being rather than best interests. Okay. So hopefully that clarifies it. However, uh, notwithstanding that, there is the issue about consistency and a number of the amendments which are brought forward are to try and achieve that consistency and read across with other uh, children's uh, legislation, uh, which I think is important uh, in order to 
ensure that there's a consistent approach being taken by the police and other organisations in their understanding of that particular term. Uh, turning now to the issue around uh, uh, that John Finney raised with regards to uh, the rank, I, I made the point last week that it's about the quality of the decision that's made, and not always, and that's best placed with the individual who I think is uh, uh, best informed to make an informed decision at that particular time. And uh, uh, operationally, I believe that the uh, rank at which that can best be made uh, is at an inspector or chief inspector level. Uh, now, clearly, it could actually be higher than that if necessary, but I think that should be the minimum uh, level at which a decision of this nature uh, should be made. And there is no need to move up to a superintendent rank. Um, uh, but, of course, superintendents do operate on an on-call basis uh, for operational uh, matters. But I do think there's an issue about the speed at which decisions can be made in these instances. Uh, and that's why I, I believe that it's appropriate it should be made as early as possible. And the rank of inspector and chief inspector uh, allows us to maximise the potential speed at which uh, that decision can be made in these important matters. Uh, and returning to the issue that Elaine Murray raised around some of the other uh, aspects, I'm more than happy to have dialogue with her between now and stage three if there are areas where she feels that there is a need for uh, some further aspects of change uh, to be uh, made and to consider what those are. Uh, turning to, um, uh, to Alison McInnes's uh, amendment, for the reasons that I've already outlined in terms of the language, is that it's, it's unclear in terms of a definition, how it would apply uh, in particular circumstances, uh, and legally does not add anything to the bill in terms of protections uh, to a large extent. Uh, therefore, um, it doesn't fit well within the bill. Uh, but I understand the general thrust to which the member is trying to is trying to achieve through this, and I'd be more than happy to explore that with her between now and stage three to see if there is a way uh, to address that issue and whether there is even a need for it to be addressed. But I think as the amendments stand at the present moment, the language and also the way in which they're drafted do not fulfil anything additional to the bill uh, and do not sit well uh, with the terms that are presently used within the bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, John, please, to wind up on Amendment 150A. Well, I certainly, um, there's not, no, not any way meant to be disparaging about the federated ranks. Uh, I mean, uh, this, this was about uh, um, the importance that was being attached to treating a young person in this way. And in practical terms, in the area I represent, in practical terms, it just means phoning someone of a... It's going to be a phone call, because there isn't going to be an inspector on in the vast majority of places. And I'm, I'm sure you're not wishing to give the impression, I say again, Cabinet Secretary, that a superintendent isn't instantly available to answer a phone um, to deal with the many challenges that the modern police service have to face without with routine um, um, office hours, not that that's how the service works. So in practical implications, I think you show the significance of taking a decision to detain a child by having it done at that rank, and I maintain the... You're pressing Yes, it. indeed. The question is, Amendment 150A be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. It's four in favour, five against, and no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 150, uh, and the question is, Amendment 150 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 151 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 150. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Question is Amendment 151 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 152 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 150. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment 152 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 153 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with Amendments 154, 155, 48, 156, 157 and 160 to 164. And I point out that if Amendment 155 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 48, which will be preempted. Cabinet Secretary, please to move Amendment 153 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, convener, the amendments in this group relate to police powers to release people <coughs> on undertaking. Uh, release on undertaking is distinct from investigative liberation under Chapter 2 of Part 1. Investigative liberation is a new concept which will allow the police to release suspects on conditions who have not yet been officially accused of committing an offence. In contrast, the power to release on an undertaking in Chapter 3 of the Bill restates existing police powers to release suspects who have been officially accused. 
Uh, these powers are used by the police under the oversight of the procurator's fiscal. Uh, this reflects the fact that once a suspect has been officially accused, the police initial investigation phase is complete and it is for the procurator fiscal to decide whether further inquiries are required and how to prosecute. The amendments in this group, which are in my name, add more detail to that process of liberation by the police. Section 19 of the Bill deals with police powers to release suspects who have been officially accused. At present, it allows the police to release such persons with or without an undertaking. Amendment 153 provides that a person who has been arrested under a warrant cannot be liberated from police custody without being subject to an undertaking. Most persons arrested under warrant will require to remain in custody to appear at court. However, there are limited occasions when the police may wish to liberate a person who has been arrested under the terms of a court-issued warrant. These decisions are undertaken in consultation with the Procurator Fiscal. This amendment makes it clear that if liberation is desirable, the person must be liberated on an undertaking to appear at a specific, a specified court at a specified time and not simply liberated to be cited. Amendment 154 is a very minor amendment simply to emphasise on the face of the bill that conditions set by undertakings have a, have a limited lifetime. Amendment 155 adds uh, what are commonly known as standard conditions to be attached to an undertaking. These currently exist in the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 and mirror some of the conditions set on a person liberated from a court on bail. The conditions include that the person must not interfere with witnesses or evidence or behave in a manner which causes harm or distress to witnesses. The conditions are a useful feature of the present system and reiterate to the person signing and undertaking the standards of behaviour that are, that are expected of them while liberated. This amendment states the standard conditions with more precision and at the same time retains, retains the flexibility to impose any further conditions necessary and proportionate to ensure that those standard conditions are observed. Amendment 156 makes clear that the sort of undertaking conditions which can be imposed include requirements to be in a specific place at a specified time or to refrain from entering a specified place or type of place for a particular period. These are curfew type conditions. The bill as introduced stated that curfews could be imposed as undertaking conditions. Amendment 156 simply rewords the non-curfew conditions as they can be applied in undertakings for consistency with the counterpart for investigative liberation as amended by Amendment 143 debated earlier. Amendment 157 provides that undertaking conditions can generally be authorised by a constable of the rank of sergeant or above, uh, but that curfew conditions require, uh, require a suspect to be a sp in a specified place at a specified time must be authorised by an officer of the rank of inspector or above. I consider that the arrangements for the management and governance of custody facilities, coupled with the safeguards provided in the Bill, mean that it is appropriate for most undertaking conditions to be set by a custody sergeant. The arguments for allowing sergeants to set undertaking conditions are similar to those that I made for investigative liberation conditions, although the context here is different. Once a person has been charged, the police need to consider whether it's necessary to keep that person in custody until they can be brought before a court under Section 18 of the Bill, or whether they can be released, either with or without an undertaking. That assessment, to, that assessment of release options should be made by a specialist custody officer in consultation with the senior investigating officer and in accordance with the Lord Advocate guidelines on liberation by the police. This process will ensure that any special conditions are tailored to the particular case that but that the final decision on what is proportionate and necessary will be made by an officer with the right knowledge and expertise in dealing with custody matters. The bill already allows a specialist custody sergeant to decide to keep a person in custody or to release them without undertaking. Uh, this amendment would allow that custody sergeant to release a person subject to 
undertaking conditions. The independence and increased professionalisation of custody division removes the need for decisions on liberation conditions to be taken at inspector level. The officer best placed to make decisions on whether a person should be released subject to undertaking conditions will, in most cases, be the sergeant in charge of the custody centre. I believe a higher level of authorisation is justified when imposing curfew conditions. There may be cases where it is necessary and proportionate to impose a curfew on a suspect, but it's important to recognise that this would place very significant restrictions on the suspect's liberty. My Amendment 157 therefore requires curfew conditions to be authorised by an inspector. These provisions have to be flexible enough to cover the full spectrum of criminal offences, but there is scope for the Lord Advocate and the Police to set out in guidance more finely grained authorisation processes for undertaking conditions in different circumstances. I believe these are matters for the Lord Advocate and Police Scotland and it would be unnecessarily restrictive to set that detail on the face of the Bill. I believe that these amendments reinforce the robust and comprehensive system for police liberation set out in the Bill. I now come to Amendment 160 to 164, also in my name. These amendments restrict, uh, restructure the provisions already in the Bill about the Procurator Fiscal's power to rescind or modify an undertaking and about the expiry of undertakings. Amendment 160, 161, 162 and 164 four are primarily drafting improvements which clarify the powers of the Procurator Fiscal and restructure the provisions about, uh, about, uh, uh, about the rescinding or, and the expiry of undertakings uh, to make them easier to navigate. Amendment 163 is more substantial. In addition uh, to restating provisions about uh, rescissions on, uh, of undertakings, uh, it gives a new power to the police to arrest people who are reasonably suspected of being likely to breach an undertaking. This is based on an existing power the police have to arrest suspects in anticipation of their breaching bail conditions. It will ensure that people who are likely to breach an undertaking can be arrested in the same circumstances as people who are likely to breach bail conditions. This could be used if, for example, the police consider it likely the person will interfere with witnesses. Actual breach of undertakings is already an offence in respect of which the person it can be arrested. I now respond to Elaine Murray's Amendment 48, which sets out the purposes uh, against which the necessity and proportionality of conditions can be tested. It restricts these to securing that the person surrenders to custody if required to do so, that the person does not interfere with a witness or otherwise obstruct the course of the investigation into the offence in connection with which the person is in police custody. The protection of the person or if the person is under 18 years of age, the welfare or interests of the person. As I explained earlier, Amendment 155 will provide more flexibility to prevent interference with witnesses and evidence, and therefore I would ask Elaine Murray not to press her amendment. I believe that, taken together, the provisions on release on undertaking and amendments in my name provide clarity and help to balance the interests of justice with individuals' rights, and I would invite the committee to support them. And I move Amendment 153. Thank you very much. Elaine, uh, please to speak to Amendment 148. It was 148. 48. Oh, no. I'm, I'm hopeful. Can I just say, because I'm weaving a little, is I'm going to go on to the end of the grouping on release and undertaking the end of a five-minute break, if that's suitable for everybody else apart from me, because I want a five-minute break after that. Uh, Elaine Murray, please, to speak to Amendment 48 and other amendments in the group. As the Cabinet Secretary said, <coughs> Amendment 48 uh, refers to standard conditions uh, and is very similar to uh, the Cabinet Secretary's Amendment 155, um, which I, I agree is probably more flexible. I do believe, however, that the protection of the person or the welfare or interests of a person of under 18 are actually important enough to be on the face of the bill. And although I am prepared not to move uh, 48, in fact, 48 would be uh, superseded by 155 anyway if 155 gets through. I'm happy to, uh, to support 155, but I still believe there may be a case for amendment at stage three to include the protection of the person and the best interests of somebody who is under 18. Um, any other members? Cabinet secretaries, you yeah. want to wind up? 
Um, Question. I'd love to say that I'd be more than happy to explore that further with the Lane Murray um, post uh, stage two process and the uh, uh, 155 amendment, if uh, agreed by the committee, has been uh, placed into the bill. Thank you very much. Question is amendment 153 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that section 19 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Call amendment 154 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated 153 to move formally, Cabinet Secretary. Moved. The question is that amendment 154 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Was that a yes? Yes, thank you. Call amendment 155, name the Cabinet Secretary, already debated 153. Can I remind members that if amendment 155 is agreed to, I cannot call amendment 48, which will be preempted. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is amendment 155 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendments 156, 157 and 158, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move the amendments 156 to 158 on block? Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 156 to 158? Thank you. The question is that amendments 156 to 158 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that section 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendments 159, 160, 161 and 162, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put on amendments 159 to 162? The questions amendments 159 to 162 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The questions at section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 163 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with amendment 153. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is amendment 163 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 164 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 153. Cabinet Secretary can move formally. Moved. The question is amendment 164 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And you'll be delighted to know that I'm suspending for a five minute break. Thank you.
Um, now can I move to and call Amendment 28 in the name of John Finney, Group with Amendments 165 and 166. John, please to move Amendment 28 and speak to the <coughs> amendments in the group. This amendment obliges a constable to not only caution a person not more than one hour before an interview, but also to, to repeat this caution immediately before the constable interviews the person about an offence. Now, a long time ago when I was uh, learning about law, the importance of timely cautions was constantly reinforced and it forms a significant part of case law. Now, one hour is a long time if you're a suspect. And we know the challenging conditions that many of the people who find themselves suspects in police stations have. Um, I think there always should be an overriding consideration of fairness. There's an opportunity to get this right st straight away. I imagine most constables will do this anyway. So at no one's disadvantaged. It simply reinforces rights, and I hope people would support that. Thank you. A cabinet secretary, you've not moved it. Could you move move. it please? Thank you. Um, cabinet secretary to speak to Amendment 165 and other amendments in the group. Uh, convener, the bill uh, provides... The bill provides uh, for and enhances the rights of individuals who are to be interviewed by uh, the police by conferring upon them the right not to say anything if uh, they so choose, other than basic information, the right to have a solicitor present and the right to have another person or a solicitor informed that they are in custody. These are fundamental rights and it's only correct that this legislation fully ensures uh, that suspects are given this information in a timely and clear way. I do understand the reason for uh, John Finney's uh, amendment as set out in Amendment 28. I'm sure we all agree uh, that the intention behind these provisions in the Bill are to ensure that anyone arrested or attending vol voluntarily at a police station is clearly informed about their rights. Uh, the issue uh, in respect of this amendment is whether it achieves that aim in a proportionate way. I could require the person; it could require the person uh, to be interviewed uh, to be informed of their rights twice in the space of the hour prior to the interview. While fully supportive of the principle that individuals should fully understand their rights, I do not believe that it is necessary for them to be informed of them twice in such a short period of time. There are other safeguards um, of individual rights in the Bill. A person must be told on arrest and on arrival at the police station that they are under no obligation to provide any information to the police other than their name, address, nationality and date and place of birth. In addition to that, the letter of rights includes information about the right to remain silent and that any information will be recorded and may be given in evidence if the matter proceeds to trial. I would therefore ask John Finney not to press uh, this amendment. I would hope that the government's amendment in this grouping will also provide some further reassurance to John Finney and also to uh, the committee. We are fully supportive of the aim to ensure suspects and accused persons are regularly advised of their rights and relevant information. In this respect, Amendment 165 adds to the information that a person must be told before they are interviewed. This amendment would require a police officer to also inform a suspect of the general nature of the offence they are suspected of committing. This information is already given when a person is initially arrested under Section 3 of the Act, but for consistency we consider it appropriate that this information is stated again prior to the interview. I consider that this is to be a particularly important change uh, for suspects who attend a police station voluntarily as such persons may not have been already given this information, but Amendment 19165 will now ensure that they are. Amendment 166 enhances the protection of the person, uh, persons who are to be interviewed under the post-charge questioning procedure. The power to allow the police to question an accused about an offence after he or she has been charged with that offence was included in the Bill as recommended by Lord Calloway in his review. An application to carry out questioning after charge has to go before a court. And where the court grants such an application, it must specify the length of time for which questioning is permitted and can add other conditions to ensure that the questioning is not unfair, such as, for example, limiting the scope of the questioning. This amendment will ensure that a person being interviewed by the police in that situation will be, be told of the time limit for the questioning and of any other conditions imposed by the court. 
It is therefore an additional protection of the rights of the accused. As mentioned, I hope these amendments will add to the information given to suspects in sufficient, it is sufficient to satisfy members that Amendment 28 is unnecessary. Thank you. Any other members? John, please, to wind up. Press or withdraw. Um, it is my intention to press this amendment and enjoys the support of the Law Society. It's, it's, it's a very modest provision. It's not to tell. It is under the section rights of suspects. It obliges a constable to not only caution um, when a person uh, one hour before, but caution in advance, and that's simply to reinforce that someone's not obliged to say anything. It is not an onerous task, and it's uh, entirely proportionate to, to support this amendment, and I hope people will. The question is, Amendment 28, we agree to it. Are we all agreed? Yeah. We are not agreed. There will be a revision. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Two, four, seven against, no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 165 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated Amendment 28. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Yes. The question is Amendment 165, we agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 166 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 28 to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 166, we agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 23, we agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 29 in the name of John Finney, group with Amendments 243 to 248, 250, 251 and 253. Can I point out that if Amendment 29 is agreed to, I cannot call <coughs> Amendments 243 and 244, which will be preempted. John Finney, please, to move Amendment 29 and speak the other amendments in the group. OK, I, I formally move Amendment 29, Convener, and I, I concur with the number of representations I've received regarding uh, received that the proposed threshold, as outlined in Section 24, a and B is inappropriate. As presently worded, quote, if the constable is satisfied that it is necessary to interview the person without delay in the interest of A, the investigation or the prevention of crime, or B, the apprehension of offenders, that wording could, and I would venture, likely will be legitimately used to cover a huge percentage of instances. Uh, the amend this amendment will ensure that the interview of a person without a solicitor present would only take place in the most exceptional circumstances. Again, something I would consider a fair and balanced approach. Alison, please, to speak to Amendment 243 and other amendments in the group. Thank you. Um, both John Finney and myself are concerned about the same things, although we have taken a different tack to try and address it. All of my amendments in this group seek to strengthen the rules around the police's ability to interfere with fundamental rights of adult and child suspects. And I'm talking about the right to be assisted by a solicitor during interview, the right to a consultation with a solicitor, the right of, right of adults to have an intimation sent to another person and the right of children to have access to their parent or guardian. Section 24 currently states that constables may, in exceptional circumstances, proceed to interview a person without their having a solicitor present if a constable believes this is necessary to proceed in the interests of investigating or preventing a crime or apprehending offenders. It grants them the right to override a suspect's request for legal assistance. Section 36, as drafted, also establishes that constables may delay a person's right to a private consultation with a solicitor on the same basis. I firmly believe that the phrase the prevention or detection of crime and apprehension of offenders is far too broad a basis on which to deny someone their right to be assisted by a solicitor. And that's why my amendments 243, 244, 245, 250, 251 and 253 switch the whole thing to a kind of interference-based definition of the need, which stresses that the restriction of these rights must be to prevent interference with evidence or another person. And they also elevate these decisions from constable to superintendent level. Members will note, and, and, and the convener has already indicated, that my amendments 243 and 244 are preempted by Amendment 29 in the name of my colleague John Finney. Uh, his amendment is uh, contrasted to mine. He would allow constables to proceed to interview the person without a solicitor in exceptional circumstances and doesn't seek to specify what these may be, uh, nor does it raise a sign off up the ranks, and in my opinion still grants the police too much leeway, though it's obviously better than what's already in the bill. The bill as drafted suggests that the denial of these fundamental rights could become <coughs> routine, and my amendments highlight the significance of these decisions and would ensure that there are proper safeguards in place to discourage the powers being misused. Okay. Anyone else with to speak? Elaine? Yes, I, <clears throat> I agree with you that there is a need for the police not to routinely abuse their powers. Uh, I don't believe that the bill as it is written actually encourages that, because it doesn't make it quite clear that it's a 
in exceptional circumstances. Uh, and it, obviously things like the prevention of crime are, are important circumstances where we may, may be necessary to act very quickly. Similarly with Alison McInnes's um, amendments, um, I don't disagree with what she's saying in terms of uh, interference and connection with the offence and so on, but I think those, to a certain extent, are, are, are encompassing. I mean, there, there might be a, a, you know, an argument for it, actually expanding it at stage three to include some of these. I'm not very sure. But on 245, on the appropriate constable being a superintendent who has not been involved in the investigation of the uh, offence, um, I don't see how somebody who hasn't been involved in the investigation of the offence can make the judgment whether or not the exceptional cases have actually arisen. So I would tend to resist that amendment also. Roderick. Yeah, just, I don't really have much to add beyond what Elaine's actually said, but to support that. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, convener, the amendments in this group relate to authorisation for interviewing suspects without a solicitor present, uh, delaying intimation of the fact that someone is in custody or delaying consultation with solicitors. I appreciate the intention behind the amendments uh, is to uh, protect suspects. Uh, this is a key purpose of part one of the bill, which aims to strike the right balance between protecting the rights of suspects and ensuring the effectiveness of investigation of a crime. In order to do this, Chapter 4 and 5 of, the, of Part 1 confer crucial rights on suspects, ensuring the right to have a solicitor present during interview, uh, the right to have someone else informed that, they're, that they are in custody, and the right to a private consultation with a solicitor at any time. There will be exceptional circumstances in which uh, these rights cannot be delivered, uh, but we should set a high bar before this can happen. Amendment 229 and 244 would amend, uh, amend section 244, which deals with circumstances in which a person could be interviewed without a solicitor. Section 244 only permits such an interview in exceptional circumstances and does not define those circumstances. This reflects the recommendation in the Calloway report uh, that interviewing a suspect without a solicitor against the suspect's wishes should only be possible in exceptional circumstances. Uh, Lord Calloway recommended that the exceptional circumstances should not be defined because case law has made it clear that it means in very rare cases, for example, where an immediate interview is required in order to protect persons or property from serious harm. Section 24.4 also includes an additional test so that, before proceeding to an interview, where there are exceptional circumstances, police must also be satisfied that it is necessary to interview without delay in the interests of investigating or preventing crime or apprehending offenders. John Finney's Amendment 29 would remove that additional test of necessity. In doing so, it would remove protections for suspects and reduce transparency in decision-making, although I do appreciate this probably was not the intention of the amendment. Alison McInnes's amendment 244 would leave the exceptional circumstances element of the test in place, but would narrow the perimeters of the necessity test. The effect of this would be, for example, to prevent the police uh, deciding it was necessary to interview in exceptional circumstances where there was an additional suspect on the run. Amendment 251 uh, substitutes the same narrow test into section 36.2, which deals with circumstances in which a suspect's, a suspect's exercise of their right uh, to a private consultation with a solicitor could be delayed. Amendments uh, 243, 245, 246, 247, 248, 250 and 253 all seek to require that decision to interview without a solicitor or to delay intimation or consultation are made by constables of senior rank. The assumption underlying these amendments seems to be that requiring particular decisions to be made by very senior officers is necessary to ensure good decision making. All constables go through professional training throughout their career to ensure that they are fully able to carry out whatever role they have to undertake. All custody facilities across Scotland now come under the command of the custody division 
and there is a corporate approach to dealing with people in custody with a national standard operating procedure and training for all officers who work in these facilities. This committee agreed last week that sergeants should make the initial decision to keep people in custody. It would be during this initial authorisation process that any request would be made to delay notification to solicitors or name persons and potentially to interview without a solicitor being present. The person who makes that initial custody decision would be best placed to consider these other rights-based decisions. The decisions covered by this set of amendments relate to rights afforded to people held in custody. I believe they are best made by specialist custody officers within custody division as at present. The decisions affected by this set of amendments may also need to be made in exceptional circumstances where time is of the essence. One example might be a kidnap scenario requiring authorisation from a superintendent before interviewing a suspect could endanger life by creating delay in a situation where time is critical. There are a relatively small number of superintendents in Scotland and while there will be always be a superintendent on call, that superintendent may not instantly be available to make such a decision. I appreciate that we are talking about very important decisions to withhold or delay the delivery of crucial rights to suspects. The bill already sets high tests to ensure that these powers can only be used when absolutely necessary. But I have also listened to the arguments put forward by Alison McInnes, and I agree that authorisation by a police constable may not be appropriate in all cases. Therefore, I would urge uh, John Finney and Alison McInnes not to press these amendments, and I will undertake to consider the matter further and to bring forward amendments at stage three to ensure that these decisions are made by constables of the most appropriate rank. I don't know if that's the body language from John Finney was he was not persuaded. I don't know whether that's done it. John, to wind up, please. Well, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary for his comments. He, he says that it's not defined what's exceptional circumstances, but likewise, he, he quite rightly alludes to Lord Carlaby's recommendations and the reference to case law there, where th there's ample, and I suppose this is the challenge where you're trying to make statute um, and, and have reference to, to case law and not have it voluminous in, in um, every time. Th there's no definition likewise of what a constable's satisfaction is or the ne what, what constitutes necessity in regard to the interview of a person. But um, I, I, I acknowledge that, that, you, that you've, you've seen that there, there are issues around this and I'm happy to wait to see what you come, come back with at stage three and I, I won't press if, no, if that... Do you, are you well, I would seek permission to withdraw then. Uh, you, John wishes withdraw. Are you agreed? I call amendment it's not doing so I'm going to amend me two four three. Call amendment two four three in the name of Alison McKinnis already debated with amendment twenty nine. Alison, move or not move? Um I, I will move this one. Um I I, I understand that the cabinet secretary has asked me not to move two four five. The question is amendment, we're all getting a bit of battle oh, no. weary here, yeah. I can yeah, I hear it in your voice. Yeah. The question is amendment 243, we agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those in... Sorry, sorry. I'm getting you see there, <laughs> oxygen please for everybody, right. <laughs> Those against, please show. 247 against that, um, no, no abstention, that amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 244 in the name of Alice McInnes, already debated with amendment 29. Move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 244 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's... 247 against no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 245 in the name of Alice McInnes. Already debated with amendment 29. Move or not move? Not moved. The question is that section 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 55 in the name of Elaine Murray. Group with other amendments as shown on the groupings. I'll take a deep breath here because I point out that there are various preemptions in this group as a result of which, and you'll be tested on this immediately after I've read it out. If Amendment 58 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 168. If Amendment 63 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 184 and 185. If the, in the group rights of under 18s minor amendments, if Amendment 38 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 32. 
Now, you all took that in, I take it, yes, by looking your faces. <laughs> Elaine, please, to move Amendment 55 and speak to the other amendments in the right. group. I'll uh, try and get through this as quickly as possible because uh, there are several uh, amendments in this, in this section. Uh, my amendments uh, aim to afford the same protection to 16- and 17-year-old children as uh, the, the bill does to children under the age of 16. My amendments 55 and 56 apply to section 25, the ability to consent to interview without a solicitor present. This bill treats older children aged 16 and 17 differently to those under 16, despite a child being defined uh, in mu much of the legislation we've passed as somebody under the age of 18, uh, such as the Victim Witnesses Act, the Children and Young People Act and the Human Trafficking Act, which we passed last week. We know that young people who have contact with the criminal justice system are often very vulnerable in different ways. Many young uh, offenders have poor literacy and numeracy skills. Some may have chaotic home lives. Recent research by the British Psychological Society indicates that many have neurological conditions or acquired brain injury, and some will have taken substances, either legal or illegal, which render them less risk-averse than normal. Apart from that, a young person under arrest with the prospect of interview by the police may be frightened, worried that their parents, school or employers are going to find out uh, and distressed. That in itself could lead to panicked rather than rational behaviour. Access to calm, informed legal advice from a solicitor is particularly necessary when a young person is vulnerable or not thinking clearly. My amendments uh, 55 and 56 would protect older children aged 16 and 17 from making the wrong decisions to consent to interview without a solicitor being present by ensuring that no one under the age of 18 can give such consent. They are compliant with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that children who are accused of breaking the law have the right to legal help and fair treatment. In addition, Amendments 57 and 58 remove children under 18 from the provisions excluding people who uh, appear to constable to have a mental disorder or who cannot communicate effectively with the police or understand what is happening from consenting to interview without a solicitor. These provisions are not necessary. 50, 55 and 56 are passed. Amendments 167 and 168 are inadequate in my view, offering this additional protection only to young people aged 16 and 17 who are on a compulsory supervision order. The vast majority of children on CS are under the age of 16 and the number who will be protected by these amendments is very small. So I do agree that these young people need protection but they will receive it if my amendments pass. Amendments 59 and 60 to section 30 are similar and, and will ensure that all children under the age of 18 rather than 16 have the right to an intimation sent to another person that they are in custody. The child's parent or another adult named by the child will receive intimation as quickly as practical. The arguments for these amendments regarding the vulnerability of under 18s are the same as for 56 and 50, 55 and 56 and an appro appropriate adult should be aware that a child has been taken into custody. Amendment 61 prevents 16 and 17 year olds requesting that no intimation be sent to their parent or other named adult. Exactly the same arguments can be made for, uh, regarding the varied vulnerabilities of older children as for Amendments 55 and 56. This amend these amendments would ensure that compatibility with the rest of the bill and with recent re legislation as stated previously. Amendment 62 gives a parent or other adult who has been sent to intimidation that a child under 18 is in police custody the right of access to the child, changing the age uh, to which that right uh, is applied from 16 to 18. Amendment 63 removes subsection uh, 2 referring to 16 and 17 year olds as that section will not be necessary if 62 is passed. Uh, Amendment 64 is consequential to 63. Amendment 38 in the name of John Pentland removes any reference to the age in the section on support for vulnerable persons so that all persons would have equal rights to support should a constable believe them to be uh, suffering from a mental disorder though this condition would be removed by John Finney's amendments which incidentally we also support or if that person is unable to sufficiently communicate with the police. My amendment uh, 32 is an alternative changing the age of 18 in uh, this, that subsection to 16. This is a backup in case my other amendments and John Pentland's amendment 38 are not passed and would provide vulnerable 16 and 17 year olds with support. And I move amendment 55. Thank you very much. I take it you've actually spoken therefore to amendment 38. John yes, Pentland's I have. Yes, so I don't yes, need to talk much here. about yeah. that. Okay. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, to speak to Amendment 167, please, and other amendments in the group. Convener, within Scots law, there are a number of definitions of a child, and those uh, are put in place uh, for different purposes. Under the Children and Young People Scotland Act 2014, a child generally means a person who has not attained the age of 18. 
However, under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 and the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, a child generally means a person who is under 16, extending uh, that definition to 16 and 17 year olds subject to a compulsory supervision order. Uh, the bill defines a child as being a person who is under the age of 18 years uh, for the purposes of arrest, detention and questioning. Any, everyone uh, of any age has the right of access to a solicitor in the context of uh, this part of the bill. However, the bill reflects uh, the, e the self-evident fact that 16 and 17 year olds do have greater capacity, maturity and autonomy than younger children and it is commonly reflected in other rights and responsibilities. Age-based laws, uh, which allow for 17-year-olds to live independently, vote, uh, work and marry, reflect the extent of self-determination that can exist at 16 years of age and beyond. Uh, with that uh, greater right of self-determination, it should come the right for older, older young people uh, to have a bigger say in the major issues and instance in their life. This bill seeks to respect, reflect and act on young people's individual views in a meaningful yet responsible way. Currently the bill provides that a child under 16 cannot consent to an interview without a solicitor being present. The bill further provides that anyone aged 16 to 17 can decide to be interviewed without a solicitor. But there is a safeguard. In order to do so, they must have the agreement of a relevant person. While I sympathise with underlying tension, uh, the effect of Lane, um, Lane Murray's Amendment 55 to 58 will be to remove the right of any 16 or 17 year old to consent to be interviewed without a solicitor. The Scottish Government prefers an approach which would allow young people aged 16 and up to make their own decision with safeguards in place to support them in this. This is consistent with Lord Callaway's recommendations and takes account of Article 12 of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, the right to an opinion, and for that to be listened to and taken seriously. Crucially, the effect of Elaine Murray's amendment would not oblige these young people to take on a solicitor. While these young people couldn't be lawfully interviewed, they can still be charged, released, or released on investigative liberation. On balance, it's prefer preferable to allow for the greater level of self-determination of 16 and 17 year olds while also providing additional protection for those subject to compulsory supervision. I can assure the committee that we plan to have further dialogue with partners, including children's organisations, in respect of these issues ahead of stage three. The wider needs of 16 and 17 year olds who may be vulnerable but not subject to compulsory supervision will also have to be reflected in guidance, practice requirements and fully implemented on the ground. I would ask then that Elaine Murray not press her amendments 55 to 58. We also take seriously the fact that 16 and 17 year olds are more mature than, are, year olds are more mature than others. After uh, further discussions with the Police Scotland and the Scottish Children's Reporters Administration, we are persuaded that amendments are required to improve protections afforded to 16 and 17 year olds in custody who are perhaps more vulnerable. I have therefore lodged amendments 167 and 168 which relate to young persons aged 16 and 17 years of age who are subject to compulsory supervision order under the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011. Our amendments provide that the bill should specifically set out that all children who are subject to such orders, and specifically those aged 16 and 17 years of age, should be treated in the same way as those aged under 16 years of age. Uh, most significantly, this will remove their right to waive access to a solicitor. Uh, the Scottish Government amendments are a positive and proportionate change. I believe that they strike an appropriate balance between respecting individual autonomy and affording protection to the most vulnerable youngsters. Section 30 of the Bill sets out the rights of a person in police custody to have another person told that they are in custody. Section 32 sets out the rights of under-18s in custody to access the person sent intimation under Section 30. The bill as introduced it did not allow a 16 or 17 year old to notify a responsible person 
that they were in police custody without requiring that person to be asked to come to where the young person was being held. Amendment 173 allows young people to intimate without requiring the relevant adult to attend at the police office. I recognise and acknowledge Elaine Murray's Amendment 59 to 64, which also seeks to deliver a, ra a, a raising of the relevant age, but this at time in section 30 and 32 uh, to include at all, at all those under age 18. As I have already mentioned, I don't believe that such a blanket approach is appropriate when dealing with 16 and 17 year olds. And I would ask Elaine Murray to consider the package of government amendments which I've brought forward and would ask her not to press Amendment 59 to 64. Amendment 38 and 32 in the name of John Pentland and in Elaine Murray respectively uh, both relate to the age at which the vulnerable person provisions in section 33 apply. Section 33 places a duty on the police to seek support for vulnerable adult suspects who, as a result of mental disorder, are unable to understand what is happening or to communicate effectively with the police. <coughs> this is intended to reflect Lord Callum's recommendations in relation to vulnerable adult suspects. As he defined a child as under age 18, under age 18, it followed that adults, but adults should be those aged 18 or over, which is the approach this section currently takes. In uh, their written evidence, however, the Scottish Appropriate Adult Network, Police Scotland and the Scottish Association for Mental Health suggested that the definition of vulnerable person should be expanded to include 16 and 17 year olds. They note that this would reflect current practice uh, whereby appropriate adult provision uh, to support vulnerable suspects aged 16 and over. The bill already makes important distinctions between those aged 16 years of age and those aged 16 and 17 years of age. On reflection, therefore, I am now persuaded that the bill should provide an additional safeguard by including vulnerable children suspects aged 16 and 17 in the vulnerable persons provision at section 33. Amendment 32, in the name of Elaine Murray, achieves this and I'm happy to support it. However, I am unable to support Amendment 38 in the name of John Pentland. This amendment would remove the age criteria from Section 33 entirely, resulting in support being sought in relation to children younger than 16. While I completely understand the desire to ensure support for all vulnerable persons in custody, Section 33 is aimed specifically at those vulnerable adult suspects who are currently supported by appropriate adults, and to put this support on a statutory basis. Those support arrangements are simply not designed to cater for the specific needs of children, needs which are met through other means. The Bill strengthens support for children and young people with a range of provisions in relation to intimation, access and support. For example, uh, children under 16 would apply, would always have uh, support from a relevant person and a solicitor even in cases where they do not have particular communication difficulties. There are also protections for 16 and 17 year olds, some of which are specific to children subject to compulsory supervision. Given that the particular support needs of children are addressed elsewhere, I consider that the focus on section 33 should remain on those aged over 16. And so I would ask Elaine Murray to consider not pressing amendment 38 in John Pentland's name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Any other members wish to? Margaret. Um, I think the, the Cabinet Secretary makes a very strong case. He refers to 16 and 17 year olds being more mature and makes reference to both the Children's Hearing Act and the, Children, the Criminal Procedure Act. Um, I welcome his um, amendment that looks at vulnerable 16 and 17 year olds, and I think that strikes the right balance as does Elaine uh, Murray's amendment at 32. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Elaine, please, to wind up. Thanks. So, first of all, I'm grateful uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for uh, accepting uh, Amendment 32. However, he has not persuaded me uh, that the other, my earlier amendments are not necessary. Uh, as I said, other uh, legislation, uh, such as the Victim and Witnesses Act and the Human Trafficking Act, recognise 
the vulnerability of people under the age of 18. And although we do have age-based laws, uh, I would point out that maturity is not necessarily the same as age. So somebody of age 14 could be more mature than somebody age 17 in terms of their life experience and so on. So uh, I am of, still remain of the um, uh, opinion that uh, children under 18 who are... Uh, are being interviewed by the police are going to be vulnerable for a whole variety of reasons, not least the circumstances in which they find themselves in, that uh, children who come to the, uh, the uh, attention of the criminal justice system are often vulnerable in a number of ways which are not absolutely obvious and on first inspection. So I will, I will press my Amendment 55. Thank you. The question is, Amendment 55 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Four in favour, five against. No abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 56, name of Lane Murray. Already debate Amendment 55. Move or not move? Yes. Move. Yes or forward? No, move, sorry. No, <laughs> yes, yes, I'm not moving. Or yes, I'm moving. <laughs> You're moving. <laughs> the question is Amendment 56 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. I'll, I'll need to hear you. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Mm. Four, four, five against. No abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 167 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to debate Amendment 55. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment... Sorry? No. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> the question is Amendment 167. We agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 57 in the name of Elaine Murray. Ready to debate with Amendment 55. Move or not move? Not moved. Not moved. Call Amendment 30 in the name of John Finney Group with other amendments as shown in the groupings. Can I point out, because I know you love preemptions, that if Amendment 31 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 169, and if Amendment 34 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 190. John, please, to move Amendment 30 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Convener. This is uh, in the section, Police Interview Consent to Interview Without a Solicitor, and this amendment I propose removes the mental disorder requirement when it appears to a constable that a person over 16 years of age is unable to understand sufficiently what is happening or communicate effectively with the police for the purposes of that person not being entitled to waive their rights to be interviewed without having a solicitor present. Uh, the Law Society and others believe it's difficult for a police officer to assess uh, whether a person is suffering from mental disorder, and, and indeed it's a challenge for many people. So um, the support of a solicitor should not be restricted as it is presently. Indeed, anyone unable to understand sufficiently what is happening or unable to communicate effectively with the police should not be interviewed without a solicitor present. I move the amendment. Thank you, John. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, please to speak to Amendment 169 and other amendments in the group. At its stage one report, the Justice Committee highlighted concerns that the definition of vulnerable person in the bill may not capture all of those needing additional support when in custody, and asked that the Scottish Government give further consideration to this. In particular concerns raised during stage one uh, was about a particular concern during stage one was about the use of the term mental disorder as part of a definition of a vulnerable person in section 25 and 33 of the bill. Uh, there were suggestions that this term should be removed and that the only criteria for identifying a vulnerable person in custody should be that they are unable to understand sufficiently what is happening or to communicate effectively with the police. Amendments 30, 31, 33 and 34 in the name of John Finney seek to do this. While I can appreciate those concerns and the desire to ensure that all those who require support to communicate with the police receive it, it's worth uh, revisiting the intention behind sections 25 and 33 and the underlying recommendation by Lord Carloway. When discussing the support needs of vulnerable suspects, Lord Carloway Calloway's report noted that individuals who are intoxicated through alcohol consumption or drug use or who are experiencing short-term illness may be unable to communicate effectively, but that such difficulties uh, will be cured through the passage of time. It also noted that some individuals may not be able to understand what is happening as a result of language or hearing difficulties, but that this could be resolved through the use of an interpreter or by other means. A deliberate and crucial distinction uh, was made between these scenarios 
and cases where an individual was a, has a permanent or semi-permanent condition which results in them being particularly vulnerable and requiring additional support to ensure they understand what is happening and can communicate with the police. It is at those, it is, uh, at those cases that the relevant provisions in section 25 and 33 are aimed. That is why, as part of the definition of a vulnerable person, the term mental disorder was used. This term encompasses mental illness, personality disorder and learning disabilities and reflects the current basis on which support for appropriate adult services is offered. The police already have considerable experience in identifying those at risk and arranging for support where necessary. Equally, they have experience in dealing with those who, for reasons that I've mentioned, may be experiencing communication difficulties of a more temporary nature. In the reference to mental disorder, if the reference to mental disorder is removed, the requirements of section 25 and 33 would apply in relation to those who are temporarily intoxicated or who simply require an interpreter or other assistance. This would result in communication support being sought where it is simply not required, with potential significant practical and financial implications for current providers of appropriate adult services. It may also have an impact on the legal profession as a result of an increase in the number of adults unable to consent to be interviewed without a solicitor present. I consider that a requirement that communication difficulties be linked to permanent or semi-permanent conditions is vital in order to identify those who generally require uh, the support and protection offered by sections 25 and 33. For that reason, I'm not persuaded that the term mental disorder should be removed. However, for the reasons uh, mentioned by John Finney and others at stage one, we do intend to keep these provisions under review as part of wider ongoing work examining the remit and provision of appropriate adults. And the criteria for support under Section 3, 33 can be changed by subordinate legislation if that is considered desirable in the future. On that basis, I would ask John Finney to consider withdrawing Amendment 30 and not to move Amendments 31, 33 and 34. My Amendments 169 and 190 make minor changes to the definition of mental disorder in Section 25 and 33. This term is currently defined by reference to Section 3281 of the Mental Health Care and Treatment Scotland Act 2003. However, subsection 2 of this section contains further context to the definition, in particular setting out characteristics which do not of themselves signify mental disorder. In order to ensure consistency with the Mental Health Act, I think it is desirable to make reference to the definition of mental disorder in its entirety. Uh, amendment 189 is a minor technical amendment to ensure stylistic consistency uh, between sections uh, 25.2b and 33.1c, which are worded in similar terms. Amendment 191 and 220 relate to regulation making powers in section 34 of the bill, removing that section from the bill and replicating it after section 53 uh, with a number of changes. At present, uh, the powers in section 34 allow Scottish ministers to amend parts of the definition of a vulnerable person in section 33, which currently provides that such persons are those who are unable to understand or communicate effectively as a result of a mental disorder. Section 32, 30, sorry, section 25.2b, uh, which describes persons who may not consent to being interviewed without having a solicitor present, also uses this definition, but without any means of altering this by subordinate legislation. I consider that such a power should be added to ensure any changes made to section 33 can, if appropriate, be replicated at section 25. I also consider it prudent to further extend this regulation-making power to allow Scottish ministers to amend the definition relate, the definitions relating to mental disorder and the police at sections 25.6 and 33.5, as those terms are, used, are also used in sections 25.2b and 33.1c, which themselves can be amended by regulation, so consequential changes may be required if those powers are ever used. Amendment 249 in the name of Alison McInnes relates to concerns raised at stage 1. 
including in the committee's report that although Section 33 places a duty on the police to request support, it does not identify where responsibility for ensuring the availability and adequate provision of suitably trained persons lies. The committee will also be aware that, more recently, Lord Bonamy recommended that the bill should identify a body with responsibility for ensuring the adequate provision of appropriate adult services. Amendment 249 seeks to place such a duty on local authorities, which currently provides such services. When the bill was introduced, it was considered that the appropriate adult system was working well and that a light-touch approach should be adopted, essentially placing the referral process on a statutory basis, but uh, going no further. However, further evidence, including that submitted at Stage 1, has persuaded me that the current model of appropriate adult service is not suitable over the longer term. Concerns have been raised around the accessibility, consistency of service provision, the exact remit of appropriate adults and the funding of this service, all of which warrant further consideration. I therefore appreciate the intention behind this amendment and I agree that action is required. However, if we are to ensure that an effective and sustainable appropriate adult service is in place, it's absolutely vital that we get the model right. To that end, we are currently leading work with local authorities, the Health Service, Police Scotland and the Mental Welfare Commission and other interested parties to identify the best way to provide a sustainable service taking into account and consideration Lord Bonamy's recommendations. Uh, workshops have been undertaken this year with key interests at a national and at a local level, and this has informed the development of potential service delivery options. We recently sought comment on these options, including uh, from those who currently deliver the services on the ground. Over the coming weeks and months, a more detailed analysis, including consideration of financial implications, will also be undertaken. For that reason, while I'm sympathetic to the issue raised by the committee and others, I think it's important not to allocate responsibility for the appropriate adult service without completing the work currently underway and reaching a consensus with those who currently deliver and use the service. I expect to be in a position uh, by stage three of the bill to set out our preferred approach for the sustainable delivery of appropriate adult services across Scotland. And on that basis, I would ask Alison McInnes not uh, to consider not pressing her amendment today. Thank you. Alison, that's your cue to speak to Amendment 249 and other amendments in the group, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, as we've just heard, Lord Bonamy's post-corroboration safeguards review recommended that the bill be amended to identify a body or an organisation with the responsibility for ensuring adequate provision of persons with appropriate skills and the qualifications to provide support for vulnerable people in custody. And he said it was a vital safeguard for the vulnerable suspect. And I welcome um, the Cabinet Secretary's recognition of the need for that. My amendment 249 is supported by the Law Society and it is intended to give effect to that recommendation uh, by proposing that we specifically enlist local authorities to uh, pro provide that support. Uh, as we know that the provision is patchy, there's little coordination and we don't know where to turn to to necessarily get it. I'm grateful um, for the Cabinet Secretary's uh, response. Uh, it was without a doubt a, a probing amendment and I think it's, it's done its job. Um, if by stage three um, we can have some sort of answer as to the way forward, I'll be more than happy and, and I'll leave it at that. Anyone else wish to speak? Delaine? Very briefly on, on uh, John Finney's Amendment 30. Um, I don't quite follow the Cabinet Secretary's argument on this because um, at the moment it's only if there's a, if a person has a mental disorder, can I say I don't like the term mental disorder? I appreciate it that it is defined in statute, but I think it's actually a slightly derogatory term for people who have mental health issues or, or learning difficulties, but I know it's, it's in law as it is. Um, the, the, the only reason that um, a, a constable could actually decide that a person couldn't be interviewed without a solicitor was because they didn't understand what was happening or communicate effectively because they had a mental disorder. Now, there are other circumstances when somebody might not be able to do that. And it doesn't just mean, you know, when somebody was drunk or under the influences of, of drugs. I mean, somebody might not be able to speak English very well and therefore have difficulty in communicating, particularly under those sort of uh, stressful circumstances. So I'm still quite, if John wishes to press this amendment, I'm quite entitled, inclined to uh, continue to support it. John? 
Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Yeah, I, I know what the Cabinet Secretary said about uh, uh, subsequent subordinate legislation, and I mean, I think it's appropriate that we keep all legislation under under revision. However, with specific regard to this, the problems are well known. They are absolutely well documented. And can I say that the police deal with the responsible animals? Certainly on the basis of my caseload, uh, a number of cases I've dealt with, they deal with it very well. Now, the, the Cabinet Secretary talked about additional support to communicate. And what we want is informed decision-making. Um, and we want uh, so that that le will legitimise information that is obtained. And I mean, there's ample case law to say that information uh, obtained under duress is in inadmissible. And I think this is a, 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 I go back to the wording there, anyone unable to understand sufficiently what is happening or unable to communicate effectively with the police should not be interviewed without having a solicitor present. It just seems fundamental. And I'll press the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Precious amendment. There to be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. We have an abstention, so it's four in favour, four against, and an abstention. What does that leave me? Oh, yeah, so it does. Well, I cast my vote um, against that amendment, so there we are. It's not agreed to, but I hear what the Cabinet Secretary has to say, and I hope there's developments in that area. Uh, to John Finney. Call Amendment 58 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already debate Amendment 55. Can I remind members if Amendment 58 is agreed? I cannot call Amendment 168. It's preempted. Move or not move, Elaine? Not moved. Not moved. Call Amendment 168 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debate with Amendment 55 to move formally, Cabinet Secretary. Moved. The question is Amendment 168 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 31 in the name of John Finney. Already debate with Amendment 30. Can I remind members that if Amendment 31 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 169, which will be pre preempted. Move or not moved? Call Amendment 169 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 30. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 169 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Yes. Question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that Sections 26 to 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 59 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already debated with Amendment 55. Move or not move? Yes. The question is Amendment 59 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Was against, please show. It's four, four, five against. No abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call Amendment 60 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already agreed. Amendment 55. Move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 60 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. It's not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Your sorry, hand sorry, was still sorry, in the no, air. I, I didn't know where you were going with it. It was still in the air. Right, so that's... Can we do See, that again, please, yeah, just to make it is. clear? Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. <laughs> four, four, four in favour, five against, no abstentions. That is not agreed to. Call Amendment 246 in the name of Alison McInnes. Already debated with Amendment 29. Move or not move? Move. The question is Amendment 246 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. That's three, four, eight against. No abstentions. That amendment... Uh, I beg your pardon. No, I know, I know. I'm just getting weary. That's three, four, six against. And no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. It keeps you awake if I make mistakes. You just all yell at me. Call Amendment 170 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 120. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 170 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 171 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 120. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 171 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are? Here. Question is the call amendment two four seven the name of Alice McKinnis already debated with amendment twenty nine. Move or not move? Okay. Not moved. Call amendment one seven two in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with amendments one seven four, one seven five, one seven seven, one seven eight, one seven nine, and one eight two to one eight seven. Can I remind members that amendments one eight four and one eight five in this group are preempted by amendment sixty three, already debated in a previous group. Cabinet Secretary please to move amendment one seven two and speak the other amendments in the group. Uh, these minor amendments in, these are minor amendments in relation to under 18s which follow from the earlier consideration the committee has given uh, to the two groups on social work involvement in relation to under 18s in police custody and rights of under 18s with reference to consent to interview without solicitor 
present, uh, sending of intimation and access to other persons uh, and other support. Uh, these amendments uh, complement and uh, give effect uh, to the provisions in the Bill uh, for the protection of child suspects while in police custody. Amendment 172 is a minor technical amendment which clarifies that the person being referred to at Section 30 is the person in custody. The effect of Amendments 174, 175, 177, 179, as well as it being minor amendments as part of the Group on Social Work Involvement in relation to under-18s, is to add to the circumstances where alternative arrangements to uh, contacting the person requested may apply. These are uh, where it is not practical uh, for the police to contact the person uh, that they have been asked to contact, where the person contacted refuses to attend, or where the local authority advises against contacting a person that the police do not have uh, to contact that person uh, or continue to try to contact that person, as may be the case. Uh, in th that case, intimation must be sent by the police to an appropriate person, as defined by Section 31.5. Many amendments in this group on social work involvement in relation to under-18s in particular, uh, Amendments 176, 180 and 181 are associated with this. Section 30 of the Bill sets out the rights of a person in police custody to have another person told that they are in custody. Uh, section 32 sets out the rights uh, of under-18s in custody to access a person uh, sent intimation uh, uh, under Section 30. It's possible uh, that uh, more than one person might be sent intimation under Section 30. In that event, uh, Amendment 182 to 184 and 186 to 187 make clear that the police must give only one person so intimation access to the child suspect at a time, uh, through though they may, in their discretion, uh, give access to more than one at a time. Uh, this approach strikes the appropriate balance between facilitating support and not being unduly burdensome on police to manage the matter. Amendment uh, 185 it provides that the issue of whether the person contacted uh, can attend at the person in custody in a reasonable time does not prevent the person being contacted by the police. And I would ask the committee to support these amendments and I move Amendment 172. Thank you very much. Any other members wish to come? Cabinet Secretary, I'd take your own to wind up. The question is that Amendment 172 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Questions at section 30 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendments 173, 174, 175, 176, 177 and 178. All in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously de debated. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move these amendments on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question being put? No. There are no objections. Um, the question is that amendments 173 to 178 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 61 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already debated with amendment 55. Move or not move? Moved. The question is Amendment 61 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. They are not agreed. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. It's 4, 4, 5 against, no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendments 179, 180 and 181. All in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously dated. Invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 179 to 181 on block. Moved. Does any member object to a single question we put on these amendments? The question is amendments 179 to 181 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Questions at section 31 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 62 in the name of Lane Murray already debated with amendment 55. Move or not move? move. The question is amendment 62 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. There will be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 4, 4, 5 against, no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. Call amendment 182 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with 172. <coughs> to move formally, please. Moved. The question is Amendment 182 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 183 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready debated with 172. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 183 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 63 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already debated with Amendment 55. And I remind members that if Amendment 63 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendments 184 and 185, which will be preempted. Elaine Murray, move or not moved? Not moved. Call Amendment 184 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 172. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions Amendment 184 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 185 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 172. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions that one se the Amendment 185 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 186 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 172. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions Amendment 186 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? 
Call Amendment 64 in the name of Elaine Murray already debated Amendment 55. Move or not moved? Not moved. Call Amendment 248 in the name of Alison McInnes already debated with Amendment 29. Alison, move or not moved? Not moved. Call Amendment 187 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 172. To move formally, please. Moved. The question is that Amendment 187 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Questions at section 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 188 in the name of the cabinet secretary. Already debated, already debated with amendment 120. To move formally, please, cabinet secretary. Moved. Questions at amendment 188 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call amendment 38 in the name of John Pentland. Already debated with amendment 55. And I remind members that amendment 38 is agreed to. I cannot call amendment 32, which is preempted. Elaine, move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 32 in the name of Elaine Murray, already debated with Amendment 55. Elaine, move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 32 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. You've won I one. Know. That's <laughs> right. She'll be celebrating. <laughs> the cake is on her at three o'clock. <laughs> Call Amendment 33 in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 30. John, move or not move? Call Amendment 189, name the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 30. Cabinet Secretary, move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment 189 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 34, in the name of John Finney, already debated with Amendment 30. Can I remind members that if Amendment 34 is agreed to, I cannot call Amendment 190. It's preempted. John, move or not move? Not move. Yeah. Call Amendment 190, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I beg your pardon? I've missed something, have I? Mm -hmm. Sorry, that's a mistake. I'm correct. <laughs> so that's two victories, one for you and one for me. Call Amendment 190 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 30. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions Amendment 190 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Questions at Section 33 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 249 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 30. Move or not moved? Not moved. Call Amendment 191 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 30. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment 191 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 110 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not move? I have Mary's permission not to move. Well, you'd have to have that, that's for sure. I know Mary, she'd take revenge. Question is at Section 35 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Slight madness is slipping in here, you can see on this chair. <laughs> Call Amendment 250 in the name... <laughs> You've noticed, sir. I'm glad somebody's noticed. Call Amendment 250 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 29. Alison, move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 251 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 29. Move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 252 in the name of Alison McInnes, or grouped with Amendments 192 and 193. Can I point out, if Amendment 252 is agreed, I cannot call Amendment 192, which will be preempted. Alison, please, to move Amendment 252 and speak to the other amendments in the group. Thank you very much. Um, section 36 establishes that a person who is in police custody has the right to have a private consultation with a solicitor at any time. At present, the bill states that this consultation should be in a quote, by such means as may be appropriate in the circumstances, for example, telephone. I note the Cabinet Secretary's Amendments 192 and 193 are drafting improvement, but they don't alter the meaning of this provision. <coughs> in contrast, my Amendment 252 amends the definition of consultation to stress that this should take place in person unless there are exceptional circumstances. It suggests it, that initial consultations can still take place over the telephone. My amendment highlights the importance of face-to-face -face advice. And Justice Scotland has stated that solicitors are unable to adequately advise their clients by telephone alone since they are unable to assess the suspect's welfare and demeanour, nor does the solicitor have the same opportunity for access to information from the police concerning the suspected offence. Furthermore, the solicitor cannot readily make effective representations to the police concerning the decision to charge or further detain if they only advise their client by telephone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Could you move it, please? Oh, sorry, I move it. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, please, to speak to Amendment 192 and other amendments in the group, please. Uh, Convener, Amendment uh, 252 deals with uh, an amendment to Section 36 of the Bill uh, to provide for solicitors to be physically present during the police interviews, except in exceptional circumstances. As members will be aware, the Bill uh, extends the rights of access to a solicitor to all suspects uh, held in police custody, regardless of whether the police intend to question the suspect, and this was welcomed by the committee in its stage one report. 
Uh, whilst it recognises it's important for suspects to access legal advice in a timely manner, Amendment uh, 252 would require solicitors to attend police stations every time a suspect is to be interviewed, except in exceptional circumstances. It's not clear from this amendment uh, what would be considered to be exceptional circumstances. The Government has uh, given extensive uh, consideration to the appropriate means by which access to a solicitor should be provided to a person whilst at a police station to enable advice and assistance to be delivered in an efficient and effective way. Lord Calloway recommended that, subject to what can be reasonably funded by the Scottish Legal Aid Board uh, or uh, to or the specific or to uh, uh, would you call it specifically himself, uh, to ultimately uh, it is ultimately for the suspect to decide whether the advice from the solicitor should be provided by telephone or in person. Uh, furthermore, Lord Calloway explained that initially the person will be expected to speak to a solicitor in private over the telephone, which will enable the solicitor to give immediate initial advice and to discuss whether the solicitor's attendance at the police station is necessary or desirable. As members will be aware, the current, uh, the current means by which suspects can secure legal advice is through the solicitor's contact line. The contact line is administered by the Scottish Legal Aid Board and legal services, legal advice to uh, suspects is provided through a mixture of solicitors uh, employed by the Legal Aid Board and private practice solicitors. It operates 24 hours uh, a day, seven days a week. Suspects can either receive legal advice over the telephone or in person if so required. Not every suspect will want to or require a personal attendance by a solicitor. Solicitors are likely to want to consider what is in the best interests of their client, whether that is advice by phone or a personal attendance. The Scottish Government favours provision which allows for the most appropriate means of securing legal advice and to allow for the preference and requirement of the particular suspect. A telephone consultation will be appropriate for uh, some individuals and in some circumstances. It's acknowledged that it may not be suitable for all, which is why the government has chosen the most flexible, cost-effective and efficient means for suspects to secure legal advice. As I have just explained, the choice of personal attendance lies with the suspect in conjunction with the solicitor, which I consider to be a proportionate and fair approach. Finally, Amendment 192 and 193 are technical drafting adjustments to avoid slightly awkwardness, the slight awkwardness of expressions in relation to consultation with a solicitor prior to interview. As I said at the start, this bill extends a right of access to a solicitor to all suspects held in police custody, regardless of whether the police intend to question the suspect. I consider this to be a significant step demonstrating the progress and commitment that is being made to safeguard the rights of suspects and detained persons. I also consider that there should be time for the new provisions in the bill to bed in before making what could be unnecessarily or proportionately inappropriate changes. And for this reason I, uh, that I've explained, I would ask uh, Alison McInnes not to press Amendment 252. Any other members? Roderick? Just, very, just very briefly to say that, uh, to, to emphasise what the Cabinet Secretary has just said the choice really ought to be for the suspect in conjunction with his solicitor. And we haven't heard anything from Alison about the cost of these proposals, but I suspect it will be significant. John. Uh, there's a cost associated itself with not having the highest standards of justice applied to people. And I don't think um, Mr Campbell, for instance, would, given the choice of phoning someone or meeting them face to face, uh, um, and assessing the entire set of circumstances as laid out by my colleague, uh, I know um, which he would is likely to, to, to choose. Uh, of course, there will be challenges associated with this, um, but um, I think we should start off with new legislation with the best possible standards, and for that reason I will be supporting Alison's amendment. Alison. Thank you. Well, in closing, uh, amendment 252 doesn't specify what the exceptional circumstances would be, I mean, and that's quite right, Cabinet Secretary, but the term is used elsewhere in the bill without any definition, um, so one must presume that the phrase is well known and can be readily interpreted. 
Justice Scotland's briefing suggests that without Amendment 252, we would be condoning in the provision of inadequate advice, and I have a great deal of sympathy with that argument. As I noted last week in committee, a 2013 study by Police Scotland and an analysis of interviews conducted in the autumn of 2013 have both shown that the fact um, that 75 per cent of suspects waive their rights to a solicitor, and I think we should all be very worried by that indeed, and this uh, um, amendment would help um, address that imbalance that's in the system. It's important that interviews are not only conducted fairly, but are seen to be conducted fairly. And I will press the amendment. Okay. Question is Amendment 252 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Yes. We're not agreed. There'll be a division. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. 247 against, no abstentions. That amendment is not agreed to. I call Amendment 192 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I've read debate 252. Cabinet Secretary, move formally. Move. The question is, Amendment 192 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? <laughs> There's groans coming from you. Know. <laughs> call Amendment 193 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. I've read debated with Amendment 252. Cabinet Secretary, move formally. Moved. The question is, Amendment 193 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Yes. You're saying yes before I'm even asked the question. <laughs> Yes, calm down now, calm down. <laughs> Call Amendment 253 in the name of Alison McInnes. Already debated with Amendment 29. Move or not moved? No. Question is that Section 36 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <coughs> Question is that Sections 37 and 38 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 194 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 116. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The Question is that Amendment 194 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that Section 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Question is that section 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call amendment 254 in the name of Alison McInnes and the group in its own. Alison, please to move and speak to that amendment. Thank you very much. Amendment 40 seeks to update the definition of biometric information and improve how the use of samples is regulated. Members will recall my concerns about the use of facial recognition technology by Police Scotland in conjunction with other forces around the United Kingdom. And the effect of my amendment would be to ensure that the retention of individuals' images by the police is subject to the same law as the retention of DNA and fingerprints. My amendment draws upon the arguably more up-to-date definition of biometrics contained within the last UK Government's Protection of Freedom Acts 2012 and extends the regulatory regime to a wider array of relevant physical data. In 2006, the Scottish Liberal Democrats introduced the law governing the use of DNA, in 2010, this was extended to cover fingerprints, but new biometric technologies are being developed quicker than primary legislation can keep up with. For example, gait and ear recognition software may too soon be a very real possibility. We're ear. Ear. We didn't realise our ears could be recognised, <laughs> but there we are. So that's why my amendment is future-proofed as best as it can be, because it would also ensure that any new collection and use of biometric information and technology by the police must be subject to the agreement of Parliament through the affirmative procedure. In England and Wales, the Biometrics Commissioner recently stated that Proper consideration should now be given to the civil liberties and other issues that arise as regards to these newer biometric technologies, and urgent steps should now be taken to ensure that they are governed by an appropriate regulatory regime. In the absence of such steps, there must be a real risk that the considerable benefits that they could be derived from their use will be counterbalanced by a lack of public confidence in the way in which they are operated by the police and or by challenges to their lawfulness. I'm not aware of any evidence that suggests Scotland is any further forward than the rest of the UK in regulating the use of emerging biometric technologies. These technologies could obviously be a useful part of the police's toolkit, but they must be properly regulated to ensure that civil liberties and privacy are protected. And I move uh, Amendment 254. Thank you. Any other members? Roddy and Margaret? Um, thank you, Convener. Just to say that in the long distant time when we consider things at stage one. I don't remember this kind of issue being discussed at all, but it is an important issue, and obviously I'd be grateful for some comment from the Cabinet Secretary on it. Margaret. Again, I think what Alison makes sense. It's important we keep pace with these new technologies and, and the, the proper protections are in place. Cabinet Secretary. As Alison McInnes has explained, Amendment 254 would provide for, uh, provide for how biometric information is used, retained and destroyed. Uh, I support the intention behind that. However, the effects of the Amendment 254 would be significantly wider than that. 
The amendment uh, could add significantly to the list of physical data that a constable can take from a person who has been arrested or detained. It would do, do this by adding other biometric information to the list of physical data in Section 18 of the Criminal Procedures Scotland Act 1995. The amendment uses the very wide definition of biometric information. It includes any information about a person's physical or behavioural characteristics or features that could be used to identify someone. This would be a significant change and implications could be far-reaching. I'm also conscious that we have carried out no formal consultation on this particular matter. Uh, this amendment would cover the type of physical personal data the police can take, the way it is used and the way it is disposed of. As always, uh, these issues, uh, these issues, uh, issues like this, uh, we need to strike the right balance between the need to prevent and detect crime and the need to protect civil liberties. I believe that at the moment we have the right balance. However, introducing the changes provided in Amendment 254 without the necessary consultation and consideration could alter that balance as an unintended consequence. Alice McInnes will appreciate that we have had very little time to consult stakeholders or consider the implications of this amendment. However, the limited discussions that we have been able to undertake have already raised a number of issues. I believe that we need to look at the whole area of biometrics in the round. We need to ensure that we have the right balance and the necessary safeguards and oversight in place. As Alice McInnes is aware, I asked Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary in Scotland to consider including scrutiny of Police Scotland's use of facial recognition technology in its work programme, and they're currently carrying out that review at the moment. I expect this review will be published in the next few months. The remit for this review goes beyond facial recognition alone, though, and considers the wider policing and societal opportunities and threats which arise from the police use of new and emerging biometric technologies. I would suggest to Alison McInnes and the committee that it is sensible to wait for that review. Once we have seen the recommendations, we will consider options and can look at wider biometric issues in the round. There may be a need, for example, for a full public consultation at that particular point, and I'm happy to discuss this with the committee once HMICS has published its report. In summary, I support the intention that lies behind this amendment. However, I believe that the effects of this amendment could be far-reaching with a high risk of unintended consequences, and it would be appropriate, it would not be appropriate to embark on such a major change without full consultation. And I would ask Alison McInnes not to press Amendment 254. Alison, please to wind up. Thank you. As the Cabinet Secretary said, HMICS is conducting that independent inquiry um, to look at biometric images. Um, and that was, of course, commissioned at the urging of uh, the Scottish Liberal Democrats. And I do look forward uh, to reading its findings. We've led the way in Scotland here over governing the use of DNA and, and, and we, we were taken um, belatedly to uh, extend that to cover fingerprints. We, we always seem to be playing catch up now and I'm anxious uh, that we don't, but I'm glad to have been able to air the issues um, and to hear the Cabinet Secretary's um, agree, you know, um, views on the matter. And I won't press it. So you, you want to withdraw it? I want so to withdraw. Need to, yeah. Alison wishes to withdraw. Is that agreed? <coughs> Call Amendment 195 and name the Cabinet Secretary and a group in its own Cabinet Secretary to move and speak to that amendment. Amendment 195 inserts a new section into the bill under which the police will be able to take drunk people suspected of committing offences to a designated place where they can receive help to recover from the effects of their alcohol intake and ongoing alcohol issues can be addressed. Uh, this replaces a power the police already have under Section 16 of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995, uh, which will be repealed through the effect of Amendment 208. And I therefore move... Amendment 195. Thank you very much. to speak on this amendment? Can't be sick. They take you don't want to wind up. Questions that Amendment 195 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Questions that Section 41 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 53 in the name of Alice McInnes, already <coughs> debated with 223. Move or not move? Moved. Call Amendment 41 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with 39. Elaine, move or not move? Moved. Call Amendment 42 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 43 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not move? Not move. 
Call Amendment 44 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated by Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 45 in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not, not move? Moved. Call Amendment 65 in your, in your own name. Not Elaine Murray, <laughs> already debated with Amendment 150. Uh, to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 255 in the name of Alison McInnes, already debated with Amendment 150. Alison, move or not move? Not moved. Questions at section 42 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Call Amendment 196 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated by Amendment 150. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions at Amendment 196 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Call Amendment 197 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with 150. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Questions at Amendment 197 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Call Amendment 36, I beg your pardon, Call Amendment 35 in the name of Elaine Murray, group with Amendment 36. Elaine, please to move Amendment 35 and speak to both amendments in the group. Right. Uh, amendments 35 and 36 relate to the change uh, in the meaning of uh, arrested and how that might affect persons who are being questioned by the police but have not been officially accused. Currently, uh, such individuals would not be described as having been arrested, but obviously once the bill is enacted, they, they will be. And as we've discussed before, there can be uh, the, the public may not actually understand what the new term arrested means. It will take time, some time for the change in the use of the term arrest to be understood by the general public and indeed the media, uh, who are used to the term arrest being applied to people who have been charged and therefore suspected of having committed a crime. Of course, any arrested person should be assumed innocent until proved guilty, even if charged. However, reporting uh, in the media of persons in England arrested but not charged, and some of them quite high profile, suggests that it, it, it is sometimes assumed that a person arrested is guilty or at least is a very least is a suspicious individual. Uh, Amendment 35 therefore requires a constable not to disclose information which might allow a person arrested but not officially accused to be identified other than when this was in the public interest and any decision to disclose information would be made by a constable of the rank of an inspector or above. Amendment 36 allows a constable to disclose information regarding the release of a person not officially accused to uh, victims and witnesses if this is in the uh, public interest or promotes the self safety and well-being of the victim or witness and such information would be released by a constable of the rank of inspector or above and I move am amendment 35 in my name. Thank you very much. Other members? Looking around, nobody else wishes to speak. Cabinet Secretary? Uh, convener, the purpose of amendment 35 is to prote protect the privacy and reputation of suspects during an investigation. I sympathise with the intention behind amendment 35 but I consider that uh, such provision is unnecessary. The committee previously accepted Police Scotland's assurances that they do not and would not release a suspect's name to the media when they have not been formally charged with an offence. I've uh, seen no evidence that runs counter to that and, like the committee, I'm reassured by Police Scotland's approach on this subject. In addition, we have always had a very strict uh, contempt of court regime which applies after charge uh, to cases which are progressing through the courts and which prevent the release of information to the media. Uh, this regime will apply in relation to suspects who have been arrested and will continue to apply during the entire time of investigative liberation. The Protection of the Contempt of Court Act 1981 is statutorily afforded to the accused from the time of arrest. No one will be released on investigative liberation unless he or she is in police custody after being arrested for an offence, at which point the protection of the Act is in full effect. The same uh, protections will apply in the case of someone liberated on a police undertaking, since they too have been arrested. Amendment 36 uh, seeks to ensure the safety of alleged uh, victims when a suspect is released on investigative liberation. Again, I'm sympathetic to the intention behind this amendment. Upholding the rights of alleged victims and ensuring their safety is crucial to ensuring a safe criminal, a fair criminal justice system. This includes ensuring that, where they may be at risk, alleged victims are informed of the suspect's release on investigative liberation and any other conditions. However, this proposal has to be considered in the context of existing measures to notify victims of the release of the accused person by the court on bail which were recently put into place as part of uh, the work to implement the European Protection Order Directive and the Lord Advocate's Guidelines to the Police on Liberation. 
We are currently considering how investigative liberation will fit into this landscape and are discussing with stakeholders to ensure that a consistent and proportionate approach to victim notification is put in place, taking into account the risk to and safety of such individuals. I would therefore ask Elaine Murray not to press the amendment. However, I'd be more than happy to meet with her to discuss this issue in more detail and to provide an update on our proposals uh, as we approach the stage three process. Thank you. Elaine, please to wind up. Uh, right. Um, and uh, with respect to uh, Amendment 35, I appreciate Police Scotland have given um, assurances, but assurances are no good if somebody has actually released the information and you know that that, that doesn't help the person who whose name may be besmirched by <laughs> information being out there that they've been uh, arrested in a circumstance when they when they never are officially charged so i'm inclined to uh, press uh, amendment 35 with regard to uh, amendment 36 i appreciate obviously there will be some overlap between the victim and witnesses bill so uh, i won't press 36 I won't move so 36. Yet. I won't move okay. 36 uh, in the hope that there will be some discussion prior to stage three, which can clarify what's happening. Right, we're pressing Amendment 35. Yes. The question is, Amendment 35, we agree to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. Four, four, five against, and there are no abstentions. That is not agreed to. Call Amendment 36 in the name of Elaine Murray. Already read Amendment 35. Move or not moved? Not moved. Call Amendment 198 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already read with 144 to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 198 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 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 <laughs> I'm getting your yeses and noes muddle up. Call Amendment 199 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already read with 144. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 199 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 200 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to read with 144 to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 200 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 201 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to read with Amendment 144 to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 201 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 202 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Ready to read with 144. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 202 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 203 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 144 to move formally, please. Moved. The question is Amendment 203 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 204 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 144. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is Amendment 204 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 205 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with Amendment 116 to move formally, please. Moved. The question is Amendment 205 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 256 in the name of Margaret Mitchell, already debated with Amendment 234. Move or not move? Yeah. Call Amendment 256. I beg your pardon. I knew it would go. I was just swinging along there too well. Um, um, where am I going? Section 50. Can, is Section 60 agreed to? Section 50. See, I'm falling apart at the seams here. Right. Um, straight to me. Call Amendment 257 in the name of Margaret Mitchell. Already debated with Amendment 234. Move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 51 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The question is that Section 52 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 206 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary Group with Amendments 207 to 213, 215 and 216. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 206 and speak to the other amendments in the group, please. Uh, convener, the amendments in this group uh, deal with consequential amendments to other acts to ensure that they work consistently with the bill's provision. Uh, the amendment 206 amends a special statu statutory form of citizen's arrest uh, found in section 59 of the Civic Government Scotland Act 1982. It talks about a person who has been arrested by a member of the public under that power being delivered into the custody of a constable. The new general power uh, of constables to arrest without warrant under section 1 of the bill means that there is no longer a need for the 1982 Act to make that provision. So Amendment 206 uh, provides for the repeal of this unnecessary provision. Amendment 207 and 213 amend the Children's Hearing Scotland Act 2011 uh, and the Road Traffic Act 1988 respectively 
to remove uh, them from them from certain uh, references to arrest. Uh, the types of arrest in question are quite different in nature from the types of arrest uh, Part 1 is intended to deal with. The word arrest is therefore removed from the provision in question uh, so that the consequences of arrest provided for in the bill are not attached to those provisions. Amendment 208 and 215 are consequential on the previous, previously debated amendments uh, which move the rules about giving information to suspects in sexual offences cases from the Criminal Procedures Act 1995 into the Bill. Amendment 209 is a very minor amendment uh, for uh, to make consistency within the Bill. Uh, amendment 210 and, two tw and to 212 uh, provide for the repeal of provisions in the Criminal Procedures Scotland Act 1995 relating to the police's duties in relation to child suspects. It is in consequence of the previously debated amendments uh, which move these rules about child suspects into the Bill so they are no longer required in the 1995 Act. Amendment 216 deals with the other side of the coin, that is, it amends the Children's Hearing at Scotland Act 2011 to update its cross-reference to procedures under the 1995 uh, Criminal Procedures Act so that they instead cross-reference to the equivalent provision in the Bill. Amendment 211 is a set of consequential amendments to section 18, 18D and 19AA of the Criminal Procedures Scotland Act 1995, which gives powers to a constable to take samples and prints. Uh, the amendment removes reference in those sections to detention because, as uh, members know, the concept of detention under section 14 of the 1995 Act is being dispensed with. And I move Amendment 206. Any other members wish to speak? I take your wish to wind up, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that Amendment 206 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 207. The name of the Cabinet Secretary are ready to debate with the 206 to move formally, please. Moved. Question is that Amendment 207 be agreed to. Are we agreed? Call Amendment 259. The name of Margaret Mitchell ready to debate with Amendment 234. Move or not move? Call Amendments 208, 209, 210, 211, 212 and 213. All in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite Cabinet Secretary to move these on block? Moved. Does any member object to a single question we put to these amendments? Yes, we're worn out. We're not objecting anymore, no. <laughs> the question is amendments 208 to 213 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <laughs> Call amendment 214 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Group with amendments 217, 218 and 219. Cabinet Secretary, please, to move amendment 214 and speak to the other amendments in the group. The amendments in this group deal with the interaction between the provisions in Part 1 of the Bill and the rest, which are able to uh, be made under other enactments. Generally, Part 1 will not apply to people arrested under the Terrorism Act 2000. This is already provided for by Sections 53, uh, but Schedule 8 to the Terrorism Act cross-references to the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 to apply certain protections under that Act. Amendment 214 updates a reference in Schedule 8 to the Terrorism Act to refer to the Bill and its concepts instead of the 1995 Act. Amendment 218 is in consequence of Amendment 214 and simply puts beyond doubt that the disapplication of Part 1 of the Bill in relation to people arrested under the Terrorism Act does not mean Part 1 does not apply to the extent previous extent expressly provided for by Schedule 8 of the Terrorism Act. Amendment uh, 218, it provides that Part 1 of the Bill does not apply to people arrested for ser uh, service offences under the Armed Forces 2006 Act. This Act sets out its own rules for the treatment of suspects arrested for service offences. Amendment 192 provides ministers with the power to use subordinate legislation to apply some or all of the Part 1 of the Bill to arrest under the Terrorism Act 2000 and service offences under the Armed Forces Act 2006 and conversely to disapply some or all of the part so that it does not operate in relation to people who have been arrested otherwise in connection with an offence. The Terrorism Act and, as mentioned, the Armed Forces Act eh, set out their own rules for people arrested under them and generally the Bill does not impinge on those rules. There may, however, be some aspects of Part 1 that it would be appropriate to apply if they 
are not already covered by the procedures in the other Acts. For example, uh, for service offences under the Armed Forces Act, it may be desirable to ensure that provisions relating to access to a third party or information to be recorded at the time of arrest do apply for the short period that someone suspected of a service offence is in police custody in the custody of Police Scotland uh, before being transferred to the custody of military police. Amendment uh, 119 uh, would allow ministers to disapply some or all of Part 1 using secondary legislation for arrests that aren't in relation to offences. There are many powers of arrest that do not relate to a person being suspected of committing an offence. For example, uh, under the Adult Support and Protection uh, Act uh, 2007, there are powers of arrest stemming from the ability of a court to grant a banning order against a subject prohibiting them from doing a variety of things, including prohibiting them from being in a specific place. There are other examples, and it may not be appropriate in every case for Part 1 of the Bill to apply in its entirety. The additions of this power uh, will allow the interaction between this Bill and each individual piece of legislation to be specifically tailored as is most appropriate. And I move Amendment 214. And can I just say, Karen, you said, I'm glad to see you wearying too, because I think you twice said 119 instead of <laughs> Amendment 219. So I think the official report will be suitably amended. But it's we forgive it. We understand. <laughs> Any other members wish to come in? Right, I take it you don't want to say that. So the question is that Amendment 214 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 215, name Cabinet Secretary already debated with Amendment 206. Uh, Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is Amendment 215 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 216, name of Cabinet Secretary already debated with 206 to move formally, please. Moved. Question is Amendment 216 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> the question is that Schedule 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <laughs> Call Amendment 258, name of Alison McInnes in a group in its own. Alison, please, to move and speak to that amendment. Thank you, Convener. I know members are tired, but I hope they'll bear with me for this um, final amendment of mine today. Um, it would introduce a code of practice in connection with identification procedures and interviewing of suspects, similar to that established by PACE in England and Wales. The Post Corroboration <coughs> Safeguards Review stated that the evidence points persuasively towards the inclusion in this bill of a statutory requirement that there should be codes of practice relating to the interviewing of suspects and identification procedures. And it argued that further regulation through the introduction of codes should be introduced regardless of the abolition of corroboration requirement. My amendment seeks to implement the draft legislation set out in that review. It would require the Lord Advocate to issue codes of practice on the questioning and recording of suspect questioning and the conduct of ID procedures. It requires the Lord Advocate to regularly review the code, consult and lay a revised code before Parliament. And in the event of a breach, it states that the current common law fairness test would apply to the admissibility of evidence. The Lord Advocate last published guidance on the conduct of visual identification procedures in 2007. There are no such guidelines at all in relation to suspect interviews. Lord Bonamy observed that the standard operating procedures and practices implemented by each of the legacy forces were not uniform and that these regional differences persist within Police Scotland. Lord Bonamy's review highlighted that some practices in these areas are inconsistent. I think this is worrying, given how critical these aspects of an investigation are. ID procedures and interviews often provide crucial incriminating evidence. My amendment would ensure that interview and ID operating procedures across the country are predictable and consistent, as the public would expect, and it would serve to improve standards. And I move Amendment 258. Thank you very much. Other members? Cabinet Secretary? Yeah, as Alison McInnes has explained, this amendment is based on recommendations made by Lord Bonamy's post corroboration additional safeguards review. When Lord Bonamy's uh, report uh, was published, I said that we would consider whether any of its proposals could be taken forward in this parliamentary session. Uh, but on the whole, our preference was to take time to consider all of the recommendations in detail and carry out a more holistic review of these recommendations alongside other reforms. I've advised uh, this committee that we will therefore only take forward a small number of uh, his recommendations this year. Uh, for example, we have introduced an amendment uh, requiring the Lord Advocate to publish the prosecutorial test. 
I still consider that there is a great value in many of the other recommendations. Uh, but such uh, substantive and important changes to our justice system do require to be looked at in the round and alongside other potential reforms. For example, as members will be aware, the Scottish Court and Tribunal Service are currently conducting an evidence and procedural review. In my view, uh, the work that we are starting uh, later this year should take into account recommendations from both re these reviews uh, to ensure any future packages of reform is comprehensive and strikes an appropriate and fair balance. I do not consider that there is a significant gap in the law in the meantime while that wider package of reform is being looked at. I understand that the Lord Advocate already issues guidance to the police in relation to identification procedures and this particular guidance is available to the public. The police produce guidance to, to officers for interviewing suspects and witnesses with numerous safeguards built in to ensure human rights legislation is adhered to. The interviewing of suspects already receives significant scrutiny during the judicial process and police procedures are constantly updated based on stated cases in the courts. The police are in the process of collating an investigations standard operating procedure document which will bring together the various legacy documents uh, on interview and other matters relating to investigations. This guidance will include the specific guidance on the interviewing of children and vulnerable persons. Once completed, the intention of Police Scotland is that this guidance document will become publicly available subject to any redactions for technical or security reasons. The recording of interviews is a subject area that would require careful examination to establish what measures were deemed appropriate and necessary. Any recommendation relating to an increase in audio or visual recording would lead to significant financial costs to upgrade infrastructure training and retention facilities. Again, I consider these issues, these are issues that should not be looked at separately, but as part of the wider set of recommendations by Lord Bonamy, alongside other relevant reform work. So whilst I do understand the good intention behind this amendment, I hope members understand why I do not think it's appropriate at this time to require such a code of practice to be published. This substantive issue should be considered alongside the other outstanding Lord Bonamy recommendations as part of the wider Criminal Justice Review project due to start later this year. It will also be considered in the context of the Justice Digital Strategy and I therefore ask Alison McInnes not to press this amendment. Alison. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm disappointed in what the Cabinet Secretary has had to, to say uh, on this particular amendment. Uh, he says that the Lord Advocate already publishes guidance on uh, the conduct of ID um, procedures. That, uh, that has not been updated for eight years, so uh, clearly not operating appropriately. I think the conduct of interviews and uh, the conduct of ID parades um, are, are fundamental issues and of a different order to many of the other things that Lord Bonamy uh, recommended and that the Cabinet Secretary is saying he will take together in a holistic way. Um, and I think, therefore, we should um, move ahead with this amendment. My amendment um, sets out that there must be full consultation um, ahead of the code of practice coming into place. We've seen during the stop and search debate the importance of statutory codes of practice and the benefits that they can bring in terms of consistency, transparency and accountability. And I believe that there is considerable scope for interviewing codes governing how other procedures should occur without risking interfering in operational matters. I think it's essential in the interests of justice that interviews and ID procedures are conducted fairly and in a uniform matter, manner, and there is evidence that that isn't the case at present, and therefore I will press my amendment. Thank you. The question is amendment 258. We agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <coughs> We're not agreed. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. It's 544 four against, uh, no abstentions. That amendment is agreed to. Call amendment 217 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 214. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Move. Question is amendment 217 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. Call amendment 218 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary. Already debated with 214. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is amendment 218 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Okay. The question is that section 53 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 219, name the Cabinet Secretary, already agreed with 214. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. Question is that Amendment 219 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 220, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 30 to move formally, please. Moved. 
Question is Amendment 220 be agreed to or we all agreed? Yes. Call me. No. Was there a no? There was a yes. There were all yeses. <laughs> Call Amendment 37, the name of John Pentland, already made with Amendment 111. Elaine, to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 221, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already made with Amendment 116. Cabinet Secretary, would move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 221 be agreed to, are we all agreed? The question is that Section 54 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 55 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 222, in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, already debated with Amendment 150. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 222 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 56 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 260, in the name of Mary Fee, already debated with Amendment 39. Elaine, move or not move? Not move. The question is that sections 88 to 91 be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. The question is that the long title be agreed to, are we all agreed? Yeah. That ends, here are the words you've been waiting for, that ends stage two consideration of the bill, and not in my script, is thank you all, and uh, we can now and all move into a darkened room and we'll lie down. <laughs> uh, we're not away yet, committee. The next meeting will take place on 27th of October when we will consider an issues paper on the Community Justice Bill before we finalise the Stage 1 report. We will also consider a number of SSIs, discuss the work programme and options for budget scrutiny, and I formally close the meeting. It's